Eternal Fire, a new adult urban fantasy series, written by R. L. Wilson, narrated by Sky Alley. Prologue The thick smoke consumes my lungs. I cough and sit upright in bed. Within minutes, I won't be able to breathe and my entire existence will crumble to ash. The echoing screams from Morgan bounce off the walls. I can't view anything but the flames dancing around the trim of my door and the thick smoke clouding my space. Is this the way it's going to end? I don't fear death, but I am certainly not ready now. I've done a lot, yet not enough. Tears race down my face as my heartbeat thuds violently. A gut-wrenching scream travels through my soul and exits my mouth. Unable to withhold my fear, I let it out. There is no chance of me getting to Morgan or even saving myself. In a moment of despair, I lower myself to the floor hoping to breathe better. Staring at the door, I pray someone breaks through the flames and rescues me. I glance at the window. I'll make a run for it. We're on the first floor. Shit, what about Morgan? Scraping my feet against the floor, I crawl toward the window. Sweat licks my face, my breathing rapid. Holding my breath, I kneel underneath the window and try prying it open. I tug and tug and cry harder. The window is stuck and I can't peek through. The smoke's too thick. Concentrate, Harmony, I say to myself. Panting to catch my breath, I collapse to the floor. That's when I get a potent scent of gasoline laced with a burnt wood aroma. Who the hell would pour gasoline around the house? Prentice is the first name swirling in my mind. I bang my head against the hardwood floors. Morgan's screams have ceased. Pain stabs at my chest as the heat from the flames pricks my skin. This is the end. There is nothing I can do. When a glaring light shines through the cracks in the door, I squint, trying to get a better view. I observe Mama floating within the smoke in front of me. She is angelic and fluorescent. It's as if she is part of the smoke, bringing light to the dark. A faint smile is upon her face and peace radiates from her being. Everything will be fine, I assume. I extend my hand to Mama. A tap on my shoulder snatches my attention away from her. I turn to find a smiling Cato. I'm here to save you, he says. Mama's here to protect me. Help Morgan. She needs you, I urge. The smile slides from his face and he shakes his head. He doesn't bother speaking another word, but his innocent presence is now gloomy. I twist back to Mama. The light gracing her face is fading. She's fading, but a darkness curses her face. A sinister smirk exposes itself on Mama's face as if she is possessed. The fire bounces off the door attaching itself to Mama. She fades more while the fire is consuming her. No! Mama, come back! I scream. My hand is still extended, reaching for her. But her existence continues to fade, as if the fire is melting her. Within seconds, all that stands before me is a cloud of smoke. The darkness has overtaken Mama. Swiftly, I twist back toward Cato, but he's gone. Who will save me now? I guess I have to save myself. I have to bust the window. It's the only way out. I hold my breath and stand, feeling for the latch. When a large hand lands on top of my right hand, I tremble as I glare at it. Uncontrollable coughs escape my mouth. While keeping my attention on the hand, I note a gold watch shining through the smoke. Judging by the expensive piece of jewelry, it's Prentice. I gasp as my eyes snap open. My sheets are wet from the night sweat. My feet tangle in the thick comforter. I sigh and wipe my forehead. Damn, what a nightmare. Chapter 1 I cringe and pause while glaring at my tattoo. It isn't the neon color or squiggly lines making me pause. Not only has it stopped growing, but it's receding. Does this mean I'm a bad person? I haven't healed anyone in two months. I need to maintain balance if I want to stay alive. I just want to exist and be happy, not worry about death. Harmony! Harmony, wake up! Room 6 has the call light on! 
Did you put him on the toilet? Janet asks. Maybe I did. I let out a huff. I hate being a nurse's assistant. I blow the hair out of my face, then spring to my feet, dropping my favorite green mug full of coffee to the floor. My face becomes warm with embarrassment and anger. Dad gave me the mug when I was 12. It's my favorite, one of the few things I have to remember him. And I shattered it into a million pieces. So much for keepsakes. Down the hall, I zipped over candescent floor tiles. The hall is long and narrow, and the walls are brick, like a psych ward. This is supposed to be luxury living for the elderly. It is far from luxurious. We run out of soap, sometimes toilet tissue, but most of the residents have little to no family contact or they wouldn't be here. I get close to room six and I'm nearly knocked down from the strong scent of urine. Mr. Franklin needs more water in his diet. The stench is so strong it can blow the eyebrows off your face. He always requests a can of beer and sometimes he gets it. I'm never going to a retirement home. This supernatural retirement home is full of witches, mostly. Some shifters, vampires, and elves. The difference between here and the streets is they all get along. They're all supernatural, but on the street, the elves and witches have had issues lately. Two young girls walk past. One says to the other, There she is. I told you she worked here. They giggle and continue walking. I should slap one of them with these latex gloves I carry. Kids make fun of the AIDS. I've heard the saying nursing assistants are certified ass cleaners. This isn't a career for me. It's just a job until I find something better. Mr. Franklin, I'm sorry. I will help you off the toilet. He is a mean, old, grumpy shifter with six children, none of whom come to visit him often. Maybe he ran them off with his nasty attitude. I've been sitting here for at least 15 minutes, he growls. I pop on my gloves and help him to his feet and pull up his underwear. The flickering light shines on his bald head and highlights his wrinkled skin. He is in his 80s. At first glimpse, you would swear he's 60. He's fortunate enough he only needs a walker, and he still has teeth. He has pictures of himself when he was younger in the army. He was handsome. I guess he was quite the ladies' wolf since he's been married four times. Get someone to fix this light, he growls. Sure thing. I follow him while he walks like a turtle to the bed using his walker. I get him into bed and hurry out before he needs something else. He expects the nurse's aides to be at his beck and call. I stare at the blinking light for a few seconds and it stops. On my way back to the nurse's station, the squeaky voice of Miss Tillman interrupts my progress. Nurse! She calls, like a bee buzzing in my ear. She calls everyone a nurse. I love Miss Tillman. She is cute and funny and she always has a big smile. I walk in her room every morning for her good energy and big smile. Unlike some, she appreciates the hard work you put in here. One second, Miss Tillman, I yell as I continue to the nurse's station. It's days like this I miss Burger King. Some of these residents are brutal. Just another day at the Paranormal Bridge Nursing Home. There is nothing glamorous about this place. The residents are grumpy, the staff is lazy, and let's not start on the nurses. Once I get back to the nurse's station, I have to clean up the coffee and my shattered mug. Hopefully I didn't piss off Robin, the nurse. She's an evil bitch most of the time. She is a witch from the Hasty Coven. They don't like paranormals from Silver City, especially witches. I pick up the shards of the mug, scraping my ring finger. The sting of pain kicks in like a paper cut. The ground beneath me rattles as the light becomes dim, overshadowed by Robin and her coffee-colored stockings and swollen ankles. She creeps up on me, quiet as a church mouse. What are you doing? Miss Tillman is calling, Robin mutters. I know, I'm getting there. I'm trying to clean this mess. I continue picking up pieces of my shattered mug. It can wait, she barks. The residents always come first. I sigh and hop to my feet with blood dripping from my hand. I know the residents are always first. It's in the handbook and common sense. But I have to take care of my hand or I can't help anyone else. She takes a deep breath. What have you done now? 
she asks while rolling her eyes. She gets on my last nerve. If I didn't need this job, I would tell her about herself. She's one of those nurses who get a kick out of picking on the aides. She has the right one today. I have a lot of patience, but it's getting thin with Robin. I'm going to clean my hand and then go to Miss Tillman's room. I hurry to the sink and run cold water on my hand. The blood pools in the sink before drifting down the drain. Once the bleeding ceases, I put a band-aid on my ring finger. I storm out of the nurse's station, slamming the door behind me. Robin is bitter and grumpy. She runs this place like a military unit. I hate working with her, and I'm sure she hates working with me. Janet is nicer, but she spends a lot of time in her office away from Robin. She is as mean as a rattlesnake to everybody, not just me. But it is hard not to take it personally. Since Morgan and I kept the apartment, the rent is much more expensive, so I had to get a better job. But the position of a nurse's aide is a death sentence. This job is too demanding for the peanuts they pay. My life is fucking miserable. It's ruined. I scan our huge apartment, which is luxurious, but it doesn't make me any happier. I cover my face with my hands and lean back on the couch. I peek through my fingers at Morgan while she stands there with a sneer. No, it's not ruined, Harmony. You've done something no one else has been able to. You got rid of the asshole we call Prentice. She grins while twirling around the living room. Yes, but my mama moved. Our rent is high as hell. Not to mention I have the worst damn job. I shouted. I know what you need. I'll make your favorite a margarita, Morgan says. With this headache, I'm going to need three margaritas and a shot of Hennessy. I snuggle under my rainbow blanket and close my heavy eyes. I want to enjoy the warm weather, but I'm tired. It's too hard to stay awake after standing on my feet at the nursing home for ten hours. The summer is ending, and Morgan wants to get a tan before autumn. But it's not going to happen today. I don't like sunbathing or the heat. My enjoyment comes from being in the house watching reality TV. To say I'm happy Prentice disappeared is an understatement. The streets are safer, the paranormal community is happy, but my life is falling apart around me. I'm lost, and there's nothing I can do about it. Mama leaving me to navigate my magic and the world around me is devastating. I have Morgan, but she's not a blood relative. Morgan and I are very different because she uses alcohol and marijuana to solve all her problems. For me, alcohol only makes things worse. The morning after drinking, I always get sick and queasy. I can't afford to miss a day at this new job. I might get fired. Might not be a bad thing. I guess I'll go back to Burger King if push comes to shove. We would have to downsize some things, but it's possible. As soon as I drift off to sleep, there's a pounding at the door. My eyes pop open. I am always on alert when someone knocks on the door. It means they got past the locked gate without ringing the doorbell. I rise to my feet and peer left toward the kitchen. Morgan is standing in the doorway holding her chest. Her breathing becomes more intense, and she looks like she's seen a ghost. Who is it? She whispers. I shrug and shake my head. I'm nervous, but not terrified. Worst case scenario, I hit them with a blast of magic. I stretch and yawn before walking to the door. I slip the chain on the door in case it's someone I don't want to see. I crack the door and gasp at the person standing before me. Chapter 2 Well, look who's gracing me with his presence. Cato stands at the door, grinning. Aren't you going to let me in? He asks. I have to contemplate it for a while, since he's ghosted me for the past two months. I slide the chain and open the door. He's still fine and gives me butterflies in the pit of my stomach. The bruises and scrapes which covered his face after the beating have all vanished. His face is clear, like the black eye and busted lip never existed. I step aside while glaring. I have to fight back a smile at the sight of him. I'm upset, but excited he's here. The scent of his cologne takes me back to the first time I met him. I sat across from him in the diner, assuming he was completely insane. But looking at his fine ass now makes my heart stop. 
Have a seat. How did you get in the gate? He eyes me from head to toe, then laughs. That little lock? Come on, you know me better. He strolls in, then plops down on our new leather sofa and runs his hand across the smooth texture. You and Morgan come into some money? He glances around, narrowing his gaze on the gold-trimmed chandelier. The new management company installed the chandelier, I laughed. My new job doesn't pay great, but the extra money I make goes to the extra rent this apartment costs. If they keep pissing me off, we'll be back in the shack we left, cause I'll give the nursing home my resignation letter. He's different. His clothes match and he smells amazing. I could lie up against his chest in the comfort of his arms forever. His hair is neat and pulled back off his face. He even got a manicure. Is he trying to impress me? If so, mission accomplished. I'm getting warm sensations in private places. Where have you been? I snarl and side-eye him. I haven't been avoiding you. He shakes his head. I had to clean up my act. Make amends for horrible things I've done in my past. Get to know myself a little better. He licks his lips. Imagining all the things he could do with his lips, I scratch my head. I have to concentrate on the matter at hand. I know he hasn't been avoiding me, and he sure cleaned up his act. I took a seat on Morgan's recliner across the room from Cato. I don't want to sit too close. He is so extremely hot my panties might melt off. Morgan comes from the kitchen carrying my favorite, a strawberry margarita. I don't need a drink for my headache anymore. Cato is curing me. She gives me the margarita and turns to Cato. Would you like something to drink? He frowns and shakes his head. No, I'm okay. Harmony, where are your manners? I'm Morgan. She glances at Cato. She didn't even recognize him. She's only seen him once before, but his appearance was nothing like this. Morgan, it's Cato, I explained. Her eyes widen. Oh, hi, Cato. I didn't recognize you. How have you been? I'm surprised Morgan doesn't say the crazy voodoo guy. Sometimes she doesn't have a filter. She bluntly says whatever comes to mind. I'm fine. Just stop by to check on Harmony. He shoots a death stare over at me. But she's mad at me. He whines. Morgan's gaze darts back and forth between me and Cato. She has a silly smirk on her face. I complained to her a few times about missing him and I was angry he hadn't come to visit me, so she is expecting fireworks. There is text, Skype, and cell phones. Why didn't you use any of those avenues to contact me? I fold my arms and roll my eyes. I can't put my finger on it, but something is mysterious about Cato. I don't know him completely. He didn't share a lot of his past or his feelings. I can't help but assume he has a background full of trauma or deadly secrets. I love the way you roll your eyes. He grins. His pink lips shine with chapstick. I want to stay mad at him, but it's hard. I did the right thing by getting myself together. He repositions himself and waits for my response. His expression is flat, as if I disappoint him. Yes, it is the right thing to do. Take care of yourself first. I don't believe the words I'm saying, and maybe it makes me selfish that I want to be a priority in his life. I was never good at hiding my feelings. Even if I don't say a word, it will show on my face. I don't buy Prentice leaving. A man who craves power doesn't vanish, Cato says. Morgan nods her head in agreement. We all should be careful. She grabs a chair from the dining room and drags it to the living room. The scratching on the hardwood floor pierces my ears. Covering both ears, I yell, Morgan, stop! The scraping noise irritates me. I'm sorry. She stops dragging the chair and flops into it. Furthermore, the first person he would come after is probably you, Harmony, Cato says. Me? I cough. Why me? I take a gulp of my margarita and fan my face. My blood is buzzing at the thought of Prentice coming after me. I finally got Prentice out of my life, and I don't want to go back down the dark road. But you can't put it all behind you. As soon as you forget about it, all hell breaks loose. Prentice will come after you. His voice is laced with concern. Too much concern. 
Those words send a cold sensation through my body, like ice shooting through my veins. But Cato is right. I have to be careful. Prentice has plenty of foot soldiers working for him. He might be watching us at this second. My phone buzzes on the coffee table. Who could this be? I talk with two people regularly. One of them is sitting next to me. And I talk to Mama already today. The caller ID says restricted. With my finger hovering over the phone, I answer. Harmony? It's the soft voice of Mama calling to check on me again. Mama, what are you doing? My inner being is suddenly happy to hear from Mama. The distance has been great. We talk about everything now since we don't live together. And she is normal, like she was before when I was younger. Harmony, I'm scared. I need your help. I was already knee-deep in water, and now I'm drowning. I frown, a bit of anxiety racing through me. As my eyes dance around the room, I realize I'm helpless. Mama is over a thousand miles away in New Orleans. I need to get to her now. Sweat greases my palms as I listen to Mama. I move my gaze to Cato, viewing his concerned expression. Morgan races from her chair at the sight of my face. She takes a seat beside me. Someone threw a rock in my window, Mama explains. Mama, it could be anyone. Maybe a kid throwing rocks. I try staying calm, not wanting Mama to know I'm terrified. If she senses my fear, she'll become engulfed by anxiety. I grab my cup as my hands tremble. I need some alcohol to calm me down. My heart is racing a thousand miles an hour. Please, someone protect Mama. No, Harmony, I had a vision. Prentice knows where I am. He's going to come after me. What will I do? Chapter 3 I don't know shit about New Orleans. I must get to Mama and save her. Since I'm an only child and Dad died, it's me and Mama. Sure, I don't have much money or a car, but it's never stopped me before. She's the only family I've got left. I'll be damned if I let the devil get a hold of my mother. Hell will freeze over first. You know your mom has those weird visions. I stop her right there. They are real, and if she says someone is after her, then it's true. I urge with a stern voice. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pry, Morgan says. Mama has a history of being crazy. She had visions and heard voices of unseen people, but she is not insane. From the corner of my eye, I observe Cato roll up the sleeves of his flannel shirt. He sits up on the couch. Don't worry. I'm from New Orleans. It's my old stomping grounds. I'm going with you. New Orleans is a melting pot of all things supernatural. There are shifters, genies, and potion handlers roaming the street. I visited once or twice when I was younger. What I remember most is the groove of the city. It's like one giant heartbeat. Morgan is my ride or die. We've been through good, bad, and the ugly. But Cato? I am not sold on him. Does he have my best interests at heart? I'm still angry at Cato, and I'm not sure if he should come along, but I have no other choice. I need his help. The more I consider it, the fewer doubts I have. What harm will he do? Besides, he helped me get Prentice off my ass. I call Marvin, the head elf of Silver City. None of the elves have seen or heard from Prentice. Marvin says this is the quiet before the storm. My gut tells me he's right. I keep calling. Someone had to spot him. He didn't disappear. I call the vampires, the shifters, and the dragons. They all tell the same story. Prentice has ghosted the supernatural world. It means he has left Detroit and is laying low. Or it's what Mama said. He's in New Orleans. Is Prentice that desperate for me to work for him? He would hunt down Mama? I'm convinced he's desperate enough. Quite a few times I had to heal him. My skin tingles with panic. The more people say they haven't seen Prentice in Detroit, the tighter my esophagus becomes. It's getting hard for me to breathe. I get a suffocating sensation. It'll be okay. Relax, Cato urges. He's right. It will be fine. I call Mama back to tell her I will come down to New Orleans with her for a couple of weeks. I dial the number and put the phone to my ear. The phone rings and rings. 
I dart glances at Cato. She's not answering, I explain as my heart rate skyrockets. She always answers for me. Send her a text, Morgan suggests. Trying to still my trembling finger, I hover over her name. I send a text simply saying, Mama, I'm trying to call you. I wait for a few minutes for her response. It feels like hours. Five minutes pass by and still no response from Mama. She is not a big texter. She recently got a new phone and I'm not sure she knows how to use text, but a phone call won't hurt. Something to ease my mind. Right now I'm having negative ideas, suspecting the worst has happened. Don't worry, I have a friend who works at the NOLA Police Department, Morgan says. Really? Who? I question. Morgan had never been to New Orleans since I've known her. My Aunt Kathy's ex-husband is an officer down there. If your mom doesn't send a text or call soon, I'll call him. That gives me a little solace, but it still doesn't solve the question roaming in my head. Where is Mama? I wish this was a dream. I close my eyes and rest my head on the arm of the couch. The knock on the door brings me back to reality. My eyes snap open as Cato hops off the couch. Morgan fidgets in her chair. Ever since we moved into this apartment, she gets jumpy when there's a knock at the door. I'll stay sitting and let Cato answer. If danger lurks behind the door, he will protect us. Who is it? Cato asks. A muffled, deep male voice answers. I swivel and glance at Morgan. Are you expecting someone? No? She growls with a frown. Who? Cato says. I spring to my feet and trot over to the door. Cato steps aside, then I view the peephole. With excitement, I swing the door open. It's Scott, Morgan! I yell. Scott and his fiance enter the living room and take a seat by the couch. As she passes by, I get a whiff of expensive perfume. The kind you smell at the mall when the sales lady sprays your wrist and you get a whiff of heaven. She is pretty, I guess. Tall and thin with long red hair. Scott could do better if you ask me. I don't envision Scott in a sexual way anymore. We just had one kiss. He will soon be married. I don't agree with it, but it's not my place to speak on his engagement. We are back to being best friends. I have my eye on Cato, even though I'm mad at him. Morgan texted me. Scott explains. Did you contact your mom? Morgan acts like she had no clue who was coming over, knowing the whole time she texted Scott. He always races over when he suspects one of us is in danger. I have an idea of what happened. It's time I take a trip. I need to find the truth. Scott's fiancé crosses her legs and surveys the apartment. She's bordering Scott's thigh closely. She may as well sit on his lap. She has her nose in the air, not even speaking. Scott is down to earth and funny. It will never work between them. I'm angered by her scrutinizing gaze. She glares around the place like it's a shack. I can only imagine her perception of me and Morgan. I texted my uncle. He says he will stop by your house. What's the address? Morgan asked. I scroll through my phone and locate Mama's phone number and address, noticing she still hasn't texted me back. I exhale and concentrate on the friends and support I have around me. Scott's fiancé still doesn't appear pregnant. Her stomach is flat as a board. Maybe she fell asleep, Scott says. I just talked with her. She didn't fall asleep. Cato takes a seat on the sofa next to my chair. I'm Cato, Harmony's friend. I'm sorry, Cato. This is my friend Scott and his fiancé. Scott, this is Cato, I say. They exchange hellos, but Miss Thing doesn't speak to Cato either. At least she's consistent. I can't sit around here waiting for my mama to call. Let's go, Morgan. Morgan bolts to her feet and races to her room. I'm praying for you, Scott says as he smiles on his way out the door with his bougie-ass fiancé. She doesn't even say bye. She never acknowledged she was in our house. I'm going with you, Cato says. No, you better stay here, I clear my throat. You may have things to do, I reply while rolling my eyes. I'm being sarcastic. Since he has been busy, he couldn't stop by and visit me. I have nothing to do but help you locate your mother. Morgan comes from her bedroom with an oversized suitcase. Morgan will be gone for two days, not two years. I got some of your clothes, too, 
she says, while setting the luggage on the ground and wrapping her hair up into a bun. Morgan thinks she's famous. She always travels with too many clothes and overpriced luggage. Not to mention she always has her sunglasses. In high school, they nicknamed her Hollywood. Let me get the suitcase for you, Cato offers. He insists on going, and actually, I want him to go. He has connections in New Orleans, and he'll protect Morgan and me. Besides, how can I resist this handsome man? Every time I glance at him, his green eyes sparkle, causing me to lose control. He carries the suitcase out to Morgan's car. He won't take no for an answer, Morgan says while giggling. How long is this ride? I ask. Fifteen hours, Cato answers. I nearly piss my pants hearing the number fifteen. Sitting in the car for too long makes me stiff and my ass sore. For Mama, I will ride one hundred more hours. Chapter 4 I have come to a dangerous place. I want revenge. My soul is angry. Stepping out of Morgan's black Honda, I curse the ragged thing for the banging and rattling it made on our way over. It's time for a new ride, but Morgan isn't done paying for this one. Hopefully we make it to New Orleans. I'm proud I have people to ask for help. Even the city leaders have respect for me. I dart my gaze around the neighborhood, on alert, making sure we weren't followed. But no one screws with Big Sam. He would probably run out the door, blazing fire down the street. Cato and I bang on the door of Big Sam's house, the criminal leader of the dragons. The red door is bright and makes me chuckle. I've never seen a door this bright. Our knocks go unanswered. After several bangs, we trot down the stairs. A lock clicks, grabbing our attention. He comes out with his hair disarranged and wearing a little tank top, which is half his size. He has an angry frown on his face, but then again, I've never seen him smile. Are you sleeping? I question. I'm up now. What's the problem? He rubs his eyes and lets out a yawn. It's afternoon and the sun is shining bright. He must stay awake at night in the vampire hours. I have a feeling Prentice is back, I reply. He scrunches his face as if there is an awful scent. Come on in, he mutters. Morgan stays in the car. She doesn't like dragons and is afraid of Sam. From the stories floating around the supernatural community, you'd consider him a serial killer. But I've met him before, and he is not as mean as he appears. I've only seen him in human form. Most dragons don't shift, but Big Sam will if he gets mad enough. We enter his home, which is nothing like I expected. Everything is bright, although he has such a dark persona. The carpet is bright red, the furniture is glowing white, we pass the huge picture of him and a lady on the wall and take a seat at the wooden table. I assume it's his wife. The fresh scent of lavender drifts throughout the house. The dragons always reek of burning wood. His wife does an awesome job cleaning. I have to go to New Orleans. I don't know if this is Prentice's way of getting me out of Detroit. It gets warmer, and I unzip my pink hoodie and lean back in the chair, trying to catch my breath. I talk fast because every minute I waste is a minute Prentice might be harming my mother. Wait, slow down, he says. Why are you going to New Orleans? My mother says Prentice threw a brick through her window. She lives in New Orleans. All right. He nods but looks confused. It's possible he located Jeanette to get to Harmony. Or maybe it's a distraction, Cato explains. Oh, okay. He's trying to get Harmony out of Detroit and take over? Sam questions. Yes, Cato replies. He stands from the chair as if he's ready to go. Big Sam's arms are the size of tree trunks. I don't know why anyone would want to fuck with him. Don't worry about nothing if he comes through here. I got something for his ass. Sam barks. Music to my ears. What I've been waiting to hear. I don't want to leave Detroit and have the shit hit the fan. My main priority is to get my mother back in one piece. It's Sam's job to keep Detroit safe while I'm gone. I know he will. I'm not worried anymore. We get back into Morgan's Honda as she sits there bobbing her head to the rock music playing way too loud. The scent of her cherry air freshener is overwhelming. At least the scent isn't bad, like black magic. Morgan... She turns down the volume. Yeah? 
It's too loud. I hold in a sigh. It's her car, but she needs to be respectful of my eardrums. And Kato doesn't like rock music. Oh, my fault. She scrolls down her timeline on Facebook and starts typing. No, don't put where we're going on Facebook. She turns to me with her forehead wrinkled. Why not? I put everything on Facebook. What if Prentice or one of his soldiers are watching? Can we at least take a selfie? Morgan questions. No time for selfies. Fine. She closes the Facebook app and enters Mama's address into Google Maps. The smirk slides into a frown and she rolls her eyes. She's definitely pissed. Why Morgan posts everything on social media, I'll never understand. Morgan is obsessed with her beauty and her curvy stature. She takes selfies all day. I see no need for a photo every day. The wind blows through my hair as we hurry down the interstate with our destination in mind. Cato sits in the back, not saying anything. He never went home to get clothes. I'm sure he will buy some in New Orleans. What's our plan? Morgan says as she flips her newly highlighted blonde hair. First, we are going straight to Mama's house. If she isn't there, we will go searching for her. I let the arm rest down and rested my elbow. My eyes are heavy, but the adrenaline has me wide awake, as if I drank some black coffee. We will talk with your uncle first, Cato says. Then I'll poke around. This makes me like him even more. Cato has never met Mama, but for me, he will go a thousand miles away. I'm happy you're not dying and you still have your magical abilities. She hesitates. She wants to say more. Her bottom lip quivers slightly. Yeah, and? I question. She stutters. I want you to stay true to yourself. Don't let Prentice turn you into a monster. I frown and scrunch my nose. I'm not a monster. Have I been acting mean? I'm on edge, irritated because my mother is missing. Who wouldn't be? I shoot a glare her way and then lean forward and pop the glove compartment open. I'll fix her. What are you doing? I'm getting your Polaroids out. She grabs my arm and squeezes tight. Put those back, she yells. No, I giggle and sift through the pictures. Coming across a school photo, I bust out laughing. It's her awkward phase in the third grade with two pigtails. Give me those, she smirks. Hey, Kato. Here is Morgan. She should put this on Facebook. I pass the picture back to Cato, and he doesn't make a peep. It's obvious he doesn't find it funny. I'm only trying to lighten the mood. Morgan is getting too serious about me letting Prentice turn me into someone I'm not. I twist my torso around to view his face. He hands me the picture back. I want pictures of you. He winks. I blush. I couldn't help it. His new physique makes him irresistible to me. Morgan snatches the pictures from me and laughs. She puts them under the sun visor. Remind me to move these pictures where you can't find them. For two minutes with my best friend and Cato, I forgot Mama is missing. Prentice is on the loose, and I have the worst job. I enjoy laughing with them. I'm sure it will be short-lived. Once we locate Mama, life will be normal. I won't be in such a bitchy mood, I utter. Be ready for whatever happens out there. Cato says. What do you mean? I shoot a stare his way. New Orleans is a nice town, but it's tough. You understand? Be careful. Prepare yourself for anything. I hadn't considered the dangers of the town. Fighting with Prentice will be dangerous enough. All I want is Mama safe and home. We know nothing about New Orleans. We will be cautious, Morgan says. She wipes her forehead and bites her bottom lip. Don't get hot-headed and go off by yourself once you get something in your mind. There's no turning back, Morgan barks. I have to admit, Morgan is right. If I get there and I can't find Mama, I will be on the hunt, and Prentice will be the prey. The tires screech as my head shifts forward. Morgan swerves, avoiding a pothole. Damn, Morgan, I shout. Sorry, did you get a glimpse of those potholes? They're the size of the Titanic, she laughs. Chapter 5 Fear skitters down my back as I survey Mama's house from the outside. I'm scared to exit the car. My hands tremble as I open the door. What would I see? Maybe she's sleeping. 
I grabbed the key from my bra. Mama mailed me a key when she first got the house. Normally, I wouldn't be nervous, but this is my mama. Sighing sharply, I glance over my shoulder at Morgan and Cato. Come on. I'll stay in the car until you tell me to come in, Morgan says. She must have a bad feeling. I admit, so do I. The light within the house makes the window glow orange. It's daytime. Mama never leaves her light on during the day. She says it would run up her bill terribly. Cato closes the app on his phone and slips it in his pocket before stepping out of the car. He warns me to be prepared for whatever we find on the other side of the door. It's small, but better than her apartment in Detroit. She did some landscaping, and the flowers billow about the yard. The boards beneath my shoes creak with every step up the porch. When I reach the top of the stairs, a black cat screeches and runs off. Sweat dampens my armpits, and my breathing is ragged. Houses don't get any more cliché. The house is on a dark, dead-end street, with tons of trees in the backyard like a forest. I jump back, bumping into Cato. The cat scared the shit out of me. I almost jumped out of my body. The house is nice and spooky. Harmony? I twist around. What? I ask Cato. What do you mean, what? You said my name, I reply. No, I didn't. He responds, his brows knitting together. Okay, not only is this house spooky, but it's haunted too? The cat scared me, but Cato's petrified, and I brought him for protection. I have a huge fear of cats, he states. Why? A cat scratched me when I was a kid. I've feared them ever since. I slip the key in the lock, hoping I don't walk into a disaster, or worse, a murder scene. I go farther into the house with Cato stepping on my heels. There's no pungency of rotting flesh, which is a good sign. The humidity here would bake a dead body in 12 hours flat. There is no sign of forced entry, and the place is clean, with the aroma of pine salt floating through the kitchen. This is Mama's house. She always has a piney scent. Cato ventures off to the bedroom while I inspect the refrigerator. I would offer them a snack to eat, but Morgan is too picky, and Cato hardly ever eats. I pop the bottle of Pepsi and quench my thirst. I'm parched. What are you doing? Cato says. He snuck up on me in the middle of taking a bite of an apple. What does it look like? Eating. You're supposed to be searching for your mama, and I'm sure she isn't in the refrigerator. He grunts while scowling at me. Can't a girl eat without interruptions? Mama isn't here. She would have come out swinging a broom. I snicker. Hearing an unfamiliar male voice would have sent Mama into kill mode. She isn't in the bedroom, but everything is in place, Cato says. We can go to my old stomping grounds. I'll ask questions, get the news. I grab my Pepsi and Apple, then scurry out the door. Cato sure brought me to a sketchy part of town. Morgan dropped us off at the bar. She went to the police station to see if her uncle has any updates. I follow him into a bar. I gasp, barely able to breathe from the smoke in the air. What kind of bar is this? It's nothing like the bars back home. There is a live band playing music. In Detroit, we had DJs. The music is intense and a lot better than records. A crowd dances in front of the stage where the band plays the blues. I chuckle at their dancing skills. I can't dance any better. A dark fellow with orange eyes walks past and shoots a stare our way. I inch closer to Cato. We stick out like a sore thumb. Everyone's clothing is bright Caribbean colors. I have on gray. And Cato, I don't have a clue what he's wearing. Is this the right bar? Sure, come on. He walks toward the bar. Isn't it great? Yeah, fabulous, I say while scanning the room. I'm being sarcastic. It isn't bad. Not my type of bar, though. Hey, hellish girl, Cato says to the bartender. She squints. Cato! She screams and scurries around the bar, stars dancing in her eyes. As she passes me, the heat bounces off her body, causing me to lean back. Her hair is a bloody red and her nails are at least nine inches long. She jumps in Cato's arms. I turn my nose up in the air and clear my throat. What the fuck? 
She finally hops off of him. Jazz, this is Harmony. Harmony, Jazz, Cato explains. I shoot a death stare at her before shaking her hand. I immediately retract my hand. Her palm is hot as hell. Oh, I'm sorry, she snickers. Sometimes I can't turn off my heat. I roll my eyes. She burned me on purpose, the heifer. She wraps her arm around Cato. How have you been, sweetie? She bats her long-ass eyelashes. She has a ton of makeup on. Maybe she is hiding scars. It reminds me of the makeup they put on the dead. This chick needs to back up before I hex her ass. I hop on the stool and tap my hand on the bar. I'm gonna need a drink to deal with this chick. A male bartender struts my way with a bow tie and no shirt. Yeesh, is this a bar or an exotic lounge? What can I get ya? He asks. Nothing, she's good, Cato says while holding his hand up. My already bad attitude turned into rage. What did you do that for? I bark as wrinkles appear across my forehead. We are here on a mission. You need to be sober, he whispers in my ear. I calm down. He's right. We are here for business, not pleasure. Follow me. He waves his hand. I hop off the bar stool and follow him and Jazz to a dark hall. A blue light shines at the end of the hall. It's a tunnel, narrow and dull. Knock on the middle door, Jazz says before hugging Cato. She is definitely affectionate. Grimacing at the dimly lit tunnel, I turn my attention to Cato. Danger lurks in the darkness. Might be ready to attack both of us. Cato assures me it's safe, so I continue deeper down the tunnel. But I have to ask about Jazz. I have never seen friends this affectionate. Who is Jazz to you? He laughs, but all I observe is the brightness of his shirt and the whites of his eyes. I should have asked later. Then I could read his facial expression. A friend from back in the day, he explains. Sure, a friend, I smirk. Yes, a friend. She owns this building. She's paid protection. She's a woman. Who is she protecting? She's also a hellhound, he laughs. I need to talk with one of my old running buddies. Jazz says he's here. He picks up the pace and avoids the conversation about Jazz. We get to the blue light and Cato knocks on the door. He got out of talking about Jazz quick. My stomach vibrates like thunder as the door opens. Cato, a large-bellied man with short, slick hair says. Bobby, Cato says. Come on in here. He pulls Cato by the arm while laughing. I enter the door behind, but I am ready to go. I already got a whiff of cigarette smoke. Judging by the overflowing ashtray, he's a chain smoker. Cato takes a seat on an old, worn sofa. I stand. I'm afraid of what might be crawling on the sofa. The sofa is antique. For sure, it's older than I am. The apartment is tiny. Only one large room. I can't turn around without stepping on someone's feet. How's life treating you? How is Randy? Bobby asks while he walks toward the kitchen area and grabs a beer out of the refrigerator. We'll talk about him later. This is my girl, Harmony. Hi, I wave and put on a fake smile. Girl? What does he mean, girl? I smirk on the inside. I want to date him, but he is dark and hard to read at times. Dating him would be a mistake. Are you still dealing with magic or are you out the game? Bobby asks. He wipes the excess beer from his mouth and burps. He can't have a wife or girlfriend. He is too much of a slob. I don't want any beer, but where is his southern hospitality? He didn't offer me or Cato a beer. I'm trying to quit and change my life for her. He glances over at me and winks his right eye. He assumes whenever he blinks or shows his dimples, I will melt in his hands. He's partially right. It was nice to have met you, Bobby, I say. Likewise, he says with bulging eyeballs. Slapping a fly on my arm, I step closer to Cato. This place is too dusty and quite filthy. Where are you going? Cato questions. I pull Cato to the side. Morgan's picking me up, I whisper. I'll text you later. I'm going to catch up with Bobby, he explains. There is some dark stuff going on. I had no idea Cato was acquaintances with Randy before.
Chapter 6 Out of paranoia, I glance around and make sure no one has come near me. Before I have the chance to panic, the squeak and rattle from Morgan's car comes barreling down the street. I'm ecstatic Morgan is here. I hop in the car as she bobs her head to blaring music. What kind of bar is this? She asks with her nose in the air. Observing the bar from the outside, it resembles a shady nightclub from Detroit, the Pussycat. It's a strip club where you can get more than a lap dance. Let's not start on the bar. I scratch my head. What did you hear from your uncle? I click my seatbelt and silently say my prayers in my head. Morgan is not the best driver. The first accident she had, I was the passenger. We were 17 then and her driving hasn't gotten any better. I have to be safe in the car with her. He isn't in the office, but he called wanting to meet up and talk about Jeanette's case. She pulls her sunglasses from her hair and puts them on. Morgan visualizes herself in Hollywood. It's hot down here, but we are not movie stars. She has on a ton of makeup. She won't have it on for long. The Louisiana heat will melt the cover girl off. Why are you all dolled up? I question. I'm going to find me a southern man. A shifter, preferably, but I'll take a human. She pushes her hair to the side of her face. Sweat twinkles down the side of her forehead. Speaking of Cato, what do you think? I don't, she says with a dismissive tone and a smudge of chocolate on the corner of her mouth. He's cute, but he's different, I shrug. He's definitely different from the supernaturals back home, but different isn't bad. He dresses weird. She snickers with a hand covering her mouth. I notice the brownie she's chewing on. She's supposed to be on a diet. Other than his weirdness, he's a nice guy, she explains. I peer out the car window at the hustle and bustle of the streets. Everything here moves fast, but to its own beat. I imagine what it would be like to live here. I think it's too overpopulated and hot. I am sticky hot, and Morgan has the air conditioner blasting. It has to be a hundred degrees and gray skies are appearing. We come to a halt at a park. What are we doing here? We're going to see my uncle. She points to a thick-built man sitting on a picnic table under a large tree. I eyeball the giant leaves billowing above the table, providing shade. Great, now we don't have to stand in the sun. He has on a creased uniform covering broad shoulders and huge biceps. He smiles, showing pearly white teeth. He doesn't appear to be Morgan's aunt's age. Her aunt is closer to 50. His face is free from wrinkles, his hair a jet black with no silver. I guess he's in his 30s, not 40s. Hey, Uncle Stone, Morgan says as we walk toward the wooden table. The trees are stiff with no wind in sight. The color of my shirt stops sweat from racing down the nape of my neck. An ice-cold Pepsi and air conditioner are calling me. Hey, niece, how are you? He says. I'm good. Who's your friend? He stands up and my eyes trail his body from his boots to the top of his head. He is tall. I'm sure he played basketball in high school. He has the deepest, smooth southern drawl I've witnessed. This is Harmony. Her mom's is the house you went to check on. Oh, yeah. Hi, Harmony. How are you? He offers me his palm. I extend my hand to shake his. It looks small, like a raisin in his hand. I've opened an investigation, but there is no sign of forced entry or foul play. He coughs and takes a seat on the table. The back door was unlocked, but it's not uncommon in this part of town. It's quiet and some people leave the door open. Has she talked about leaving or being unhappy? He asks. I already know what he presumes, but Mama never leaves without telling me. She said Prentice is back, and I believe her. She did not leave. I look him square in his beady, dark eyes. She was taken. He pulls a notepad from his pocket and jots down a few details. He asks for Mama's description. I know he's doing his job, but Mama's not a case or a number. Morgan is staring at the group of boys walking past. Did Morgan come to help me or herself? She's always been crazy about boys, but now is not the time. Who do you assume took her? He asks, kind of cocky, like I don't understand. 
I want to scream Prentice Darby, but telling him might get him killed. He's human. Humans have huge egos and always have a point to prove. Prentice is not the type to prove a point with. Uncle Stone would end up missing or dead. I have an idea, but I don't want to accuse anyone. This is an open investigation. Don't go snooping. He shakes his head. Yeah, sure, I won't go snooping. My mama is missing. No doubt I'm going to find out what happened. First, I have to escape this humidity. It is sucking the life out of me. Silence hangs between us for a while. Once we get more information, I will inform you. He extends his hand. And please, let me do my job. I give him a half-assed handshake and a half-assed smile. He had no sense of urgency or conviction he would find Mama. I wonder how long he has been a cop. I need someone with gray hair and a gut who has some damn experience. And finally, the wind blows and the leaves rustle. It lasts all of three seconds. Nice meeting you, he says. Likewise, I smile. Morgan, I yell. She had her back turned to us, watching the dudes throwing the football. What? She jerks and turns around with her sunglasses down on her nose to get a better peek at the guys. Let's go. Oh. She pushes her glasses closer to her eyes. Thanks, Uncle. She gives him a hug. He walks to his car with a slow limp. It must be a southern thing, or those damn boots are too heavy for his feet. In this heat, I would have on sandals with my uniform. I pick up the pace to the car. I need some air conditioning. The people of Louisiana walk around in the sweltering heat. This is heat stroke weather. It's too damn hot. What did you find out? Morgan asks. Nothing. He said it's an open investigation, so don't go snooping. I twist and give her a side eye. Morgan giggles. Yeah, right. You don't go snooping. He has a better chance at winning the lottery. I've always been nosy. Curious is what I like to call it. No use in me stopping. I'm going to put my snooping to use. Before we make it to Morgan's car, we're surrounded by a gang of people glaring at me and Morgan. I'm sure they notice we're foreigners. I shudder at the amount of people. There's at least two dozen, mostly women, only two guys. Shit, my heart falls into my sock. I will have to fight this mob. Morgan pulls her hair back and throws her sunglasses to the ground. Morgan's uncle left a couple of minutes too soon. Where are the police when you need them? I grab for the box cutter in my purse. My lips part to speak, but nothing comes out. My head tingles. I shouldn't have spent the last few weeks chilling instead of working out. I'm not physically fit for this shit. Who y'all be? A guy with a gold grill in his mouth steps forward and asks. I barely comprehend what he's saying. His gold teeth have me mesmerized. Who we be? Who the hell is he? We're minding our business, trying not to die from heat exhaustion. Morgan eyes the scenery, and she grabs my hand. Her hands are wet and clammy. She is terrified, and I'm nervous. We are out of our element. Relax, nobody here's going to hurt you. He puts his hands up. I'm curious, who are you? You're not from this neck of the woods, so where are you from? He talks so fast, I can't get a word in. His skin is so dark, it's scary, like necrotic tissue. But I suppose if you live in this type of heat, you get a permanent tan. I exhale, elated they don't want any trouble. They're mobbed up like they are ready to fight. No, we're from Detroit. What are you trying to find down here? He has a mean stare and his nostrils flare. I'm not sure if it's his normal appearance or if he's mad. I don't want to piss him off. I better lie and say we are here visiting Mama. I'm here visiting my mother. We don't want any trouble. A southern accent tears through the crowd. I can't make out what the person is saying. It's a bunch of gibberish. With a pang of exhaustion and fatigue from the humidity, I don't have the strength to fight. A lady makes her way through the crowd and closer to me. She has a yellow shirt and her eyes match. She grins, then covers her mouth. She has to be near my mother's age and I don't disrespect my elders unless I have to protect myself. Is she crazy? 
She extends her hand like she will grab me. Sweat lines my palms and I take a long, deep breath. I concentrate, dipping down into my magic. I will use it if I have to. Harmony, she says. Welcome home. Chapter 7 Morgan helps me up to my feet. We check each other for bleeding or large wounds. Sure, we both have scrapes and bruises, but we kicked ass. I've still lost. My mother was right there at the tip of my fingers, and I still couldn't rescue her. I'm a failure, unable to get my magic to work. Andrea is right. I need some magic training. We limp down the stairs. Sore joints are getting the best of me. My footsteps are like dragging a sandbag. I need to sit, relax, and have a cold drink. Although today was an epic failure, at least she's alive, I wonder where the wolves are. The echo of screams and loud crashes has ceased. The silence is loud. When we last saw them, they were winning the fight, but where are they? Not knowing makes me tense. The beasts are big. I hope the wolves are still alive. We make it to the final step, and I catch a flash of color. Cato stands in the hall. His bright-colored shirt is the source of the light. When did he get here? It doesn't matter. He's here to help me. Harmony, are you okay? He grabs my arm and helps me into the kitchen. I am nearly paralyzed from the fear Prentice may hurt Mama. My feet are painful and heavy. I brace myself before I fall. I'm fine, but Mama's gone again. She was here? His face lights up. Yes, Prentice disappeared with Mama in hand. She didn't run or break free. I gasp. She's not being hurt. She appeared normal. Her clothes were clean, her hair intact. I don't understand his motive. I'm sorry. He lowers his head, staring at the floor. He doesn't want to observe the tears rolling down my cheeks. I can't survive in this world without Mama. How could I be this ignorant? If it makes you feel any better, Prentice's forces have disintegrated. Prentice is finished in New Orleans. I have mixed thoughts about Prentice leaving New Orleans. It's great for the town, but where the hell is he going with my mother? We will find Prentice, and when we do, your mother is coming home, Cato states. I grin. He always knows how to make me smile. Indeed. His positivity gives me temporary hope. He's certain we're getting Mama back. No matter what I tell myself, though, tears continue to flow. This battle isn't over. Soon I'll be in another fight for my life. We walk out into the field where Derek and the rest of the pack are. They are yelling and jumping, overexcited about defeating the huge creatures who attacked us. I silently count the wolves, and it relieves some of the tension. We all made it out alive and in one piece. Look on the bright side. Jeanette is alive, Morgan says. I wouldn't have gotten this far without Morgan. She is definitely a fighter. Maybe not a supernatural, but she has some kick-ass moves. Where is your mom? Derek asks, scanning the door. The brown wolf sniffs the air. Her mom is not here anymore, he mutters. No, but we'll find her soon. Damn snake slipped right out of my hands. My temperature rises and my hands form into fists. I'm angry, so much so my blood buzzes. Derek extends his hand. You have won the trust of the pack, and we swear our allegiance to you. I put my hand in his, and he kneels at my feet. Then he hops back to his feet as Andrea approaches the crowd. I don't want her to know about the wolves. I hoped I could hide it for a little longer, until I was back in Detroit. Her smile slides into a frown. Every step she takes is harder than the last as she gets closer. Her face looks tight and red. She is going to burst. I let out a shaky breath, pushing fear back down inside of me. I hope she doesn't think I'm betraying her. This has nothing to do with her. Darting her gaze from me to the pack to Cato, she asks, What's this all about? She folds her arms and glares, her light brows furrowing as she scrutinizes me. Momentarily stuck in anger, I don't say a word. I don't want to say anything I would regret. Should I panic about this, Maiden? She slants an evil eye at Derek. It's not your concern, Derek growls. 
Stay away from my family, or you will deal with me. He puts his hands in the air. The wolves are only here to help. He turns around and marches down the hill, with the wolves marching behind him. Prentice disappeared with my mama, and he may never come back. The pack helped me. I wouldn't have known she was here if it weren't for them, I explain. Yeah, his operation is clean. Wiped out, Cato says. I have something for you. She pulls her purse strap off her shoulder. Not another damn book, I hope. There is no time, especially for more family secrets. She slips a folded piece of paper from her purse. She hands the paper to me. I'm too afraid to open it. Chills wind down my spine. I get a burning sensation while holding this paper, like inside is a bomb, and once I open this letter, it will explode in my face. Not a literal bomb, but a mega blast of information. Go ahead, open it, Andrea says. Her eyes twinkle, but is she trustworthy? Everyone is a suspect except Morgan. She's on my side. I glance at Morgan, who nods her head. Then I unfold the paper. Deed of land? What is this? I growl at Andrea with a frown. A copy of a land deed. Property Prentice owns. She points her finger to his name. You should stay in New Orleans, because I'm sure he'll be back. Stay here? Morgan turns up her nose like something stinks. Continue the fight here in New Orleans, she says with a sincere expression on her face. You'll get power and respect here. You're a strong witch. I'm not fighting for power. All I want is my mother back. She grabs the deed from me and slips it back into her purse. She wears her disappointment on her face. She exhales. You know where to find me if you need me. Then she strolls down the hill toward the city. Morgan lights a cigarette. My nerves are too bad to stay here. I almost quit smoking. I chuckle. Yeah, sure. What do you say? We stay here or go back to Detroit? Cato says. What do you think? I question. With the land deed Andrea showed us, he might be back. He wipes the sweat from his forehead. This city is busy, and these streets are dangerous. I trust his opinion, and he did as promised. He has won some of my trust. Not my heart yet, but some of my trust. Need more of Harmony and her ongoing battle with Prentice? Grab the next book in the series, Eternal Shadow. Bookstoread.com slash u slash 3n8ga8. Chapter 8 My home is in Detroit. There's no way I'm from this hot southern town. I blink repeatedly, trying to take in my surroundings. My eyes rest on the lady in my face with the gleaming yellow eyes. Her hair is jet black, with deep curls reaching her shoulders. This is Harmony? A husky voice from behind me says. I never turn to acknowledge the voice. I'm focused on this lady scowling at me and Morgan. She's amazed to see me, and she won't stop staring. An uncomfortable ache washes over me. Her aura isn't dark, but it makes me uneasy. I'm Andrea, and these are all our family members. Her eyes peruse the crowd. We're all witches. She's hard to understand, thanks to a deep twang in her voice family. I'm an only child. They are no family of mine. They resemble a pack of misfits. Some have tattoos and others have several piercings, even on their eyebrows. They are different, but if they'll help me, I'm open for a discussion. You're not alone. Us witches support each other. Whatever you need, Andrea adds. I'm slightly confused. How does she know I'm a witch? I will play it off and see where this goes. An elephant jumps off my back. Is this true? I have other witches here to support me? Never had witches support before. The witches back home are part of the Red Coven. I'm not a part of the Coven. I'm the outcast. I pause. You're not trouble. I grin and let Morgan's hand go. This is my best friend, Morgan. I try stepping away, but she throws her arm around me for a hug. The aroma of her cheap perfume wafts through the air. I'm surprised she has a fresh scent in this hot air. The rest of the group softens up and smiles, except a couple. Not everyone is happy I'm here. They need not worry. I'm not enthused either. And definitely not trying to steal anyone's spot. Once I find Mama, I am getting the hell out of here. 
She eases her grip from around my neck. Let me show you and your friend around town. Bourbon Street. Andrea takes us to Bourbon Street, and it's like no other. Morgan is in heaven, amazed by the bright lights and the big men. She could stay here forever. The mix of Latin, African, and other nationalities roam the town. Live bands play music as people freely walk the streets. Hardly any cars in view. The aroma of thick spices marinate through the heat. I can almost taste gumbo and jambalaya sizzling in my mouth. We have several bars and restaurants, Andrea blabs as she flits her eyes between me and Morgan. Where do you want to go? The strip bar, Morgan says as her gaze meets a group of guys entering the club. What the hell are we going to do in a strip joint? I can't find anything out about Mama in there. Sure, Andrea says. Can I have a word with you in private first, Harmony? Her bangles clank as she points toward the woods. We walk off while Morgan stays behind, talking with the rest of the coven. She's in good hands, I hope, but the group seems genuine. I can't judge covens solely on the red coven, those bitches. I know your mom, Andrea says. My head snapped in her direction, then my glare grows more intense. She has my attention. I don't want to do this tourism shit until I know Mama is safe at home. I'm an old friend of Jeanette's. I held you in my arms the night you were born. I take a step back as fear creeps into my chest. How was she there? I was born and raised in Detroit. At least, I assumed I was. Andrea. A monotone voice called. I'm trying to wrap my head around her statement. I was born in Louisiana? Can't be. Hey, Mel and Chris, Andrea says. She greets seven more people before explaining they're all witches. Everyone, this is Harmony. Shit, how many damn witches live here? Chris doesn't smile, but he moves closer toward me. I prepare to shake his hand, but he pushes me. Now I'm on defense. What the fuck type of welcome is this? I concentrate. I grab him and send a small electric shock down his arm. It's a warning pulse. There's more where that came from. I don't like this dude. He shifts his weight from foot to foot as he gets ready to charge. He lunges toward me, and I grab him and sling him across the road. I jerk my hand back as small sparks of fire jump from his shirt. Okay, hold it, Andrea says. Chris is a hothead. He doesn't mean any harm. Morgan comes racing to my side. What the hell is going on? She barks. Where I'm from, shoving someone is a threat. I roll my eyes. I don't take threats kindly. Chris pops back to his feet. He is one strong ass with a spark of fire in him. It burns like hell. He's one of my strongest defense witches, Andrea says. Chris now stands beside me. I'm welcoming you to New Orleans. His face is slim with a pudgy nose. He's suspicious. He needs to know I don't play. It was nice meeting you all, but I'm melting in this heat. Morgan and I have to go. I'd better go before I have to fuck Chris up. Wait, what about the strip club? Morgan says. Morgan, we will go to the strip club tomorrow, I whisper in a lower tone. She nods, getting the picture. I'm ready to go. There's one more thing I want to show you, Harmony, Andrea says. She pushes her curly locks back behind her ear and walks toward the woods. I follow behind Andrea's flowing, multicolored skirt, intrigued by what's so important it couldn't wait until a later day. A cooler day, when my breathing's better. I have on black ripped shorts and a tank top. My pasty skin is turning all kinds of red from sunburn. I need to get to Mama's house and take a cold shower. We get over to a large tree and stand in the shade. She grabs a book from the large brown purse she brought along. Judging by the peeling leather and the faded spots, the book is pretty old. A picture of a faded tree is on the front. It's wrapped in a yellow ribbon. She extends the book in my direction. Heart pounding and gazing at the book, I reach in to grab the book. As a breeze flows from the book, I pause, narrowing my gaze at Andrea's yellow eyes. What is this? It's your, it's our family tree, she says as her cheeks turn a rosy red. It can't be. Are we blood related? I grab the book and untie the yellow ribbon. 
I flip through the pages, seeing hundreds of names. This chick is crazy. She told me she is Mama's friend. You're on page 87, Andrea added. I pause, then flick the pages until I get to 87. The words whirl around on the pages. Once they settle, there's Jeanette Adams, born to my grandparents. Then below my mother is my name. But wait, all this is written in ink. Oh my god, they scratched my father's name out, but his name starts with a P. What the fuck is going on? I'm in a twilight zone. This is some bullshit. This lady is a fraud. My face is warm. I grip the book with my hands and glare at Andrea. How do I know this is real? I'm on page 77, she says. Who is my father? Who scratched out his name? I keep glaring at Andrea, waiting on an answer. Jeanette kept your father a secret. I promise I'm not sure who your father is. She never changes the tone of her voice, even though I'm getting louder. Not a good beginning. My father's name was Carl Adams. He was a great man, I scream. Carl, she dated once she moved to Detroit, but he can't be your father. How the hell would she know? Maybe she should mind her own damn business. I continue flipping through the pages, and Andrea's name is on page 77, like she said. I guess we're third cousins. We're related? Yes. I have to calm down if I want answers from her, and I guess this is not her fault. If I was born here, how did I end up in Detroit? I question, since she knows so damn much. Your mother was unwed and left a little after you were born. Her hands fidget, grabbing at her skirt. Should I trust her or not? But why would she make this up? If daddy ain't my daddy, who is? Funny thing is, mama never mentioned she had a cousin Andrea. I have one more question for you. I hold up my right index finger. She shakes her head. Sure, ask me anything. Is Prentice my father? Chapter 9 Prentice. Yes, the name rings a bell. She sighs with a flash of despair across her face. I realize she knows more information. I pressure her to tell me more about Prentice. Although she is apprehensive, she slowly reveals more pieces to this puzzle. Prentice Darby? Andrea explains, saying his name made her tremble. He grew up with us. The rise and fall of her chest becomes more rapid, as if she is afraid of him. We all hung out together in high school as kids, she says. My words tangle in my throat. I scoff at the impossibility. Mama knows Prentice. Sure. I squint at Andrea while trying to prevent the sweat from entering my eyes. I'm perspiring more profusely thanks to this bunch of shit she is unloading on me. My armpits are wet and sticky. You are saying Mama knew Prentice since she was a teen. She blinks and nods slowly. Exactly what I'm saying. A sharp pain shoots within my belly, causing me to grab my abdomen, dropping the book to the ground. I lean against the tree. Are you okay? Andrea asks. I'm fine. Just need a little air. I pant, my lungs getting smaller by the second. She bends and picks up the book. I don't want to upset you. We can talk about this later. No. I grab her arm and stare in her eyes. I need to find out everything about my mother and Prentice. You should talk with your mother about this. I'm sure she'll be willing to tell you everything. She hurries and grabs the book from the ground while trembling. I swallow hard. She can't tell me. I shake my head. She's missing. Her eyes widen as she shivers. Missing? What are you talking about? Saying my mother is missing sends goosebumps up my arms. What if I never find her? I came here because she told me Prentice was after her and he took her. Taken? She slips the book in her purse, then puts her hand on her forehead. Her eyes dart around the forest. Her breathing increases. Are you sure? She walks over to the picnic table and takes a seat. I follow and take a seat across from her. Yes, I'm sure. Sorry, I got a little dizzy, she mumbles. I usually know everything happening around here. No one told me about Jeanette. She slams her hand on the table. She's concerned about Mama. After all, they are cousins. 
But it's weird Mama never mentioned her before. She talked about her family in spurts, reminiscing on all the fun she had growing up, the family parties and barbecues. But she never mentioned anything about Prentice, even after he showed up at her apartment in Detroit. Will you help me? I question. Sure, let's go to the headquarters. I will tell you everything. We walk into an ancient castle. It's huge, with several large rooms and doors, all with French hand-carved fixtures. Morgan walks around the place, admiring the large drapes with beautiful colors. You'd never see such beauty in Detroit. This place is beautiful, Morgan says as she runs her hand across the mantel, then stares up at the chandelier. Harmony, look at this, Morgan yells from the back of the castle. Her voice travels sharply to the front of the house. In a second, I say to Morgan while I admire the Persian rug in the main room. The cool air is giving me life. The air conditioner must be on max. If I lived here, I'd never leave. The rest of the coven witches take seats on the huge floral upholstered furniture. There are at least 15 witches here. I'm sure the coven is even bigger, and Andrea is the leader. Let's talk in my office upstairs, Andrea says. Her footsteps creak up the wooden stairs to the top floor. The aroma of baked goods floats through the air, making my mouth water. It's the scent of Mama's sweet potato pie. They must have the same recipe. There are even more doors, to bedrooms and bathrooms, I assume, but all the doors are closed. She walks to the double doors and slides them open to a sun-drenched room with sheer curtains. A desk sits in the middle of the floor, surrounded by a sea of windows. This place is magnificent. And elegant. Unlike Andrea. How did they make money to pay for this place? She must be important in this organization to have such a huge office. She walks over to her desk and plops down in the chair before opening a desk drawer. What will she pull out? Hopefully not another family tree. I've had enough family reunions for one day. She pulls a book from the drawer, then slides it across the desk. Your mama and Prentice's yearbook pictures are in there. The year 1998 is in gold letters on the front of the book. Mama was a senior. I flip to the senior section, and there she is. I snicker at how young she was. She had the brightest smile and the prettiest long, silky hair. Who'd kidnap such a beautiful soul? Prentice was a senior, even though he is a year older than your mama. I glare at Andrea. Darkness crosses her face. My instincts rattle, telling me not to open the book. But I have to see. With my trembling grasp, I flip the pages and get to the section where the last names start with D. A part of me hopes he isn't there. It would explain why Mama didn't tell me about him. Like Andrea mentioned, Prentice Darby's photo is in the senior section. With a devilish snarl on his face, he appears equally as evil as he does now. My blood is boiling. I'm confused. Seeing him younger disgusts me. His eyes are similar to mine. My eyes fill with tears I can't hold back. My crying is not because of weakness. It's out of rage. How could Mama not tell me? Prentice wasn't born here. She rests her elbows on the desk. Meanwhile, I'm uncomfortable, squirming in my chair. He moved here before the start of ninth grade. Your mother got pregnant with you in high school. She was concerned about your life. She didn't feel you were safe. My heart tremors. Why was Mama concerned? Was she aware I'd get this curse? Prentice went to Detroit, and shortly after Jeanette moved to Detroit. Her face becomes more tense, and wrinkles appear on her forehead. I never understood why she moved. She had no help in Detroit. I pleaded with your mom to stay here amongst family. She refused. It was like she was under a spell. Prentice has been a big part of my life long before I started working for the snake. How deep-rooted is the truth? My whole life has been one big lie. I've heard stories about Prentice being dangerous. It's best you leave it alone. You haven't learned to use your magic, I see. You are a young witch, she giggles. You need a little guidance. I won't leave it alone until my mother is safe and at home. She grabs the book. You are sure about this. She stuffs the book back in the drawer. I shoot her a sharp stare. Never been this sure about anything. Then, child, you will need some training. Training? 
I ran his ass out of Detroit. I've learned to use my magic a little. Maybe I could learn a few pointers from Andrea. I'm sure she's been doing this a lot longer than I have. Is Prentice my father? It's consuming my thoughts. No, my mother would never be with such scum. Before you go unlocking the truth, are you positive you want to know? Some things are better left unsaid. The only thing I want from Prentice is my mother. Finding out if he is my father would explain some things, but not change my life. I've made it this far without him being my father. I don't need him. My father is dead, rest his soul, and no one will ever take his place. A thunderous crash rings out, shaking the building like a small earthquake. It causes the chandelier to rattle above my head. I duck. Since when does Louisiana get earthquakes? My heart is now pounding. Shit. Where's Morgan? Stay here, Andrea yells. The crash came from the first level. Is she fucking serious? I'm not staying here. I'm going to get Morgan. I race behind her to the door and down the stairs. Constant screaming and pounding pierce the air. I gasp and nearly trip down the stairs, making my way to the main room. The gruesome sight makes my stomach shift. Chapter 10 A full-on brawl. There is a pack of werewolves attacking the coven. I've had my share of fights, but nothing like this. There's hair pulling and claws swinging through the air. I narrow my gaze at a mocha-colored female whose skin fills with thick black fur as her fingernails extend and sharpen into claws. Glad I'm not the witch on the other side of her paw. She turns into a full-grown werewolf and flings her paw with ease. She slices the face of a small-framed witch. Blood shoots from her face, splattering across the antique furniture. My coven can handle this, Harmony. They're trained. Stay put. I can't tell they've got it handled. They're getting their asses kicked, if you ask me. I'm not the type to stand and stare in the middle of destruction. There are chairs being thrown and broken across backs. The wolves are outnumbered, but still kicking ass. They must have some deep-rooted issues. These shifters are blazing mad. I grab hold of the banister of the stairs as a huge wolf lunges toward a witch, knocking her to the ground. The banister shakes. I dart my gaze around the main room in search of Morgan. I clench my teeth at the sight of a werewolf getting close to her. My morning oatmeal bubbles in my stomach. Hey! I yell. The werewolf extends his paw toward Morgan and she jerks back, hitting the wall. I scowl at the face of the silver wolf, feeling my temperature rise. Becoming enraged as the werewolf swats at Morgan, scratching her face. She wipes her cheek and glares at the blood smeared on her hand. Wait, Andrea says. I mumble, rushing past her, headed straight for Morgan. Next thing I know, I'm square in the werewolf's face. I don't play about Morgan. I muster up all the energy within and push him to the ground. I stand in front of Morgan. I dare one of these wolves to come near her. The wolf jumps to his feet. I guess he wants to fight. He takes the first swing and I block the punch with my hand, sending a hot buzz racing up his arm. Shit, he says, snatching his arm back. A love tap is all I sent. The next one will be brutal. His green eyes bore into mine. I don't blink or twitch a muscle. He swings again, this time landing a punch to my face. He hits like a girl. I grab his right palm and I notice the fire within his soul. The fire in the lamps, in the air, it's everywhere. A hot bolt shoots through my hand, knocking the werewolf across the room. The flame stopped, but smoke continues to float from my hand. What the fuck? I sucked fire out of the atmosphere. What's going on here? I have no control over my magic. It does whatever it wants. I'll be one of the best witches if I learn how to operate my magic. I'm a novice, but I'll be an expert soon. The werewolf gives out a long howl of pain. All the werewolves stop and glare at me. I stare back. He fucked with Morgan first. She has nothing to do with this. He needs to learn how to treat a lady. Andrea struts over. Harmony, you need to stop. Her eyes bulge and she shakes her head. The silver werewolf shifts into a human with curly brown hair and a pointy nose. Funniest thing is, he only has on underwear 
a pair of blue boxers. Is he going to roam the street in his underwear? His chiseled chest is covered in hair. He shifts his gaze from me to Andrea. This is all your fault, he says, walking closer to Andrea. She squints her eyes. How is this my fault? She yells. You stepped into my territory. The veins in his neck bulge and his face flushes pink. What else was I supposed to do? Damn, you can't walk anywhere you want around here. I better learn where to walk while I'm visiting. Andrea walks close to the werewolf and throws her hands on her hips. No one tells Andrea what to do. If I want it, I'm damn sure going after it. Everyone else is silent. I'm shocked Andrea would get in this man's face. He's a big man, about 6'5", but she isn't bowing down. I gave you a reasonable offer you should have taken. Her tone is a low growl. I will make another offer. 85,000, my final offer. Her stance is defensive and she doesn't flinch. She doesn't back down, even though he's nearly twice her size. Hell no. He pounds his right fist into his left palm. I flinch. The slam of his fist is loud and hard. 15,000 less than the original offer? He frowns and his hands ball into fists. I'm frozen. Will he knock her into the kitchen? I glance at Morgan as she wipes specks of blood from her face. Seeing them makes me angry again. Derek, I had to invest too much energy in trying to take over your territory. The price dropped. Take it or leave, Andrea says. Her eyes flicker between him and the other wolves, like she's hoping stupidity flies from his mouth. Then she'll unleash her wrath without regret. I see a slight tremor of his hand as he runs it through his curly hair. I'm not interested in selling. Search elsewhere. His eyebrows furrow. You don't have the luxury of creating any more enemies. A hiss escapes her lips as she tries to remain calm. The panic dances across her face, hard to hide. Enemies. I don't have any fucking enemies. You don't? You have a big army on the loose, I'd say. He walks closer in her face. Now you wouldn't want me to tell everybody, would you? An evil sneer appears on his face, reminding me of a snake. He says this with cockiness. Andrea is a little fidgety, nervous even. What is she hiding? Oh yeah? She says as her voice cracks. I'm curious. Who's on the loose? He has Andrea trembling when a minute ago she was the big bad wolf. Now she's shaking in her tube socks. Yeah, that's right. Derek confirms. Spill the beans already. If I have an enemy, I'll destroy them with a snap of my fingers. Why haven't you done it yet? Bottom line is, stay away from my territory, or maybe I'll pay your enemy a visit. He turns his gaze in my direction. Anxiety engulfs my chest. Shit, I don't want to know her enemy. I shake my head, keeping my gaze on Derek, expecting something vile to come flying from his lips. Prentice is in town, and he's been making a lot of friends. Chapter 11 Derek and his pack race through the broken window, the same way they came in. Is this a message for me? I bite my nails, overthinking this. If Prentice wants me, no need to send a message. He has an open invitation to come himself. I'm ready. This is some crazy shit, Morgan whispers. What happened? I'm not sure. There was a huge crash and they came rushing in, Morgan whispers while holding her face. I eye the crowd as everyone chats about the fight. Andrea has taken a seat in the dining room. She taps her fingers on the table as she smokes a cigarette. I guess I need to find out what this fight is about before I lose my life. Since she is the leader of this group, I have a ton of questions. Something tells me this situation just escalated, and she knows more about Prentice and his whereabouts. I slip in a chair across from Andrea, and before I open my mouth, she barks. It doesn't involve you. Bullshit. He scowled at me when he said Prentice is back in town. I got this under control, she urges. I'm sure you do. Derek doesn't appear to be joking. A mean howl and a sharp stare. He means business. I will take over territories and make everyone safer, she explains while blowing white puffs of smoke through the air. Where have I seen this before? 
Prentice was preaching the same bullshit. I'll keep an eye on her. I'm nothing like Prentice, if that's what you're thinking. I didn't say it, but it certainly crossed my mind. We attended high school together, but I take care of my neighborhoods. Folding my arms, I give her a disbelieving stare. It's hard to trust someone you met today, even if we are related. Silence hangs between the two of us for several minutes. I squint and exhale deeply. Come on, I'll show you, she suggests. This is Derek's territory, Andrea says, as we drive over a pothole nearly the size of the Grand Canyon. The neighborhood's a rundown slum. It reminds me of the projects in Detroit, where there is no grass and the children run wild without supervision. The chances of someone making it out of those neighborhoods and going to college is slim to none. Violent crimes in the inner city are high. Andrea visualizes a change she can make. I'm not sure why. I don't foresee change being possible. How do you propose a change in this area? Derek is not doing anything for these people. He doesn't care. He's been floating dark magic through here for decades. How else would he make his money? Her eyes are focused on the road, but I still detect the heavy tension in her shoulders. The scent of sewer wafts through the air. I scoff, wrinkling my nose. Something should be done immediately about the rotting odor. It's had the pungency of rotten flesh for at least 20 years, Andrea replies. She doesn't even cover her nose. How did they get accustomed to the odor and the living conditions? It resembles a third world country. I've never been to one, but I do watch television. Abandoned buildings with missing windows, dirt for grass and empty beer bottles laying on the curb. The place needs a facelift. The sight of this place makes me lose my appetite. I'm not sure if I should trust her, but she sounds sincere about transforming this neighborhood. Is her motive financial gain? How long has Derek controlled this neighborhood? He's always controlled this part of town, but now it's time for a change. I'm going to take you to Oak Creek, the area which mirrored this one before I cleaned it up. We ride for a few miles in Andrea's Porsche. The headquarters is huge, and I imagine her house is nice. She has been able to support herself financially for sure. It appears as if we went to a new city. The streets are clean and free from debris. No giant potholes. Huge colonial-style houses with large picture-frame windows. It has old-world charm with a modern twist. This neighborhood belonged to another pack before the coven took control. So I'm making a difference in the communities I control she says with confidence. She is right if what she says is true. It is better because she controls the town. I've had enough for one day. I need to get back, find Morgan, and continue searching for Mama. We zoom back to the coven headquarters. As the sun is setting, the witches are repairing the busted front glass. Did you know Prentice is in town? I question. If she is hiding the fact he's in New Orleans, maybe she knows where he is. I found out with you when Derek stated it. We get near the front door as the scent of Cato grabs my attention. He's around here, but how did he find me? I guess he's always been able to magically appear. Entering the front door, I expect Cato to be sitting on the couch, but he's not. Maybe it's wishful thinking. Where is Morgan? I ask the blonde witch sitting on the couch. She points toward the kitchen without glancing my way. I hurry toward the kitchen and am nearly knocked to the ground when the door swings open. Morgan and Cato enter the dining room. I knew he was here. Morgan has a bandage on her right cheek from the damn werewolf scratching her. Hello, Cato, Andrea says. Huh, Cato knows Andrea. He gets around. Who hasn't he met in this town? Long time no see, Andrea continues. The light flickers off her eyes as they sparkle at the sight of Cato. Cato speaks, but he's resistant, like she's someone from his past he doesn't want to associate with. He's not excited like he was when he saw Jazz. Have a seat, Cato. Let's catch up. I've been trying to get Cato to join the coven for a decade. Andrea takes a seat, glaring at Cato as if she can't believe he's standing in front of her. She leans back on the couch and crosses her long legs. Is her old ass trying to flirt with Cato? No, Andrea, nice catching up with you, but we gotta go, Cato explains. Well, we didn't talk much yet. Besides, I might help with whatever you're searching for. He's here to help me find my mama, 
I reply. She points her finger to me, then Cato. How do you two know each other? I glance at Cato and notice the darkness across his face. He is shut down. Something's not right. We met in Detroit, I say. Cato, you know Harmony is my cousin, right? Andrea blabs. His eyes bulge as his warm gaze meets mine. Then he shoots a sharp stare at Andrea. Really? He questions in disbelief. Morgan takes a seat on the couch and exhales. I'm tired, Harmony. I want to go rest. Wait a second, Morgan, Andrea says. I tried several times to help you break the curse Mateo cast upon you. The spell was strong. We never did crack the code. How is Mateo? Andrea prods. Cato rolls his eyes as his nostrils flare. Mateo ain't here to talk. He gives her a mean snarl and struts toward the door. Morgan mumbles, goodbye, as she races for the door. We'll stay in contact. Come by tomorrow, Andrea says. I don't understand why Cato is being rude, rushing to leave the headquarters, especially considering the fact he knows Andrea and she has helped him in the past. There's something fishy going on here, and it stinks. I shut the door behind me and rush to the car. What was that all about, Cato? I know you are in the middle of your family reunion, he uses air quotes, but be careful with your long-lost cousin. He sounds really snappy, like he has an attitude with me. Why are you upset? I'm sorry. He wipes his forehead and exhales. It's not directed at you. I'm warning you, Andrea is not everything she claims to be. Chapter 12 What do you mean? I snap my head toward Cato. He needs to explain. He's overprotective, and it reminds me of Mama's overbearing ways. She's certain someone is out to get me. You've known her all of 30 minutes. I've known her since I was a child. Trust me. I stare into those bedroom eyes of his and give him a smirk. I trust you. I shouldn't have gone to Andrea's headquarters since I'd just met her today. The only reason I went is because she had information about Mama. I got a hit on Jeanette's location. Let's go, Cato says as he fires the engine. Horror fills my insides. I'm glad he got a hit on her location, but what if she's being abused or beaten? My magic has a mind of its own, and I can't control the destruction unleashed upon the kidnappers. I click my seatbelt and roll the window down, hoping for a cool night breeze to hit my cheeks. Instead, the sting of the summer's heat brushes against my forehead. God, does the heat ever relax here? Morgan, you okay back there? She doesn't answer. I twist my head to observe Morgan sitting with her arms folded and head tilted down. She's been saying she's tired all day. I guess she needs a nap. Sure explains why she let Cato drive. I am a ball of emotions. No turning back now. How desperately I have longed to be in her presence, to get a glimpse of her. I need to know if she's fine. Now I'm within minutes of seeing her, but I'm uneasy. A dreadful intuition encroaches, like darkness. What the fuck is this? Cato parks the car across the street from a warehouse. There's a busted window and bars on the door. They better not be holding my mother in a raggedy shack. It appears abandoned from the outside. I imagine how the inside must be. Goosebumps prickle over the skin of my arms. I glare at Cato, waiting on him to explain. He darts his eyes in my direction without turning his head. He shrugs. This is the hit I got. Two bulky men stand by the door. They are hiding her in plain sight, but it's about twenty minutes outside of the city. There is a lot of vacant land behind the warehouse. The street is full of houses and businesses even. We scope out the place. Not much activity coming in or out. The upper window is highlighted by a luminous glow. Maybe Mama's being held upstairs. Cato! I scream. He jerks. What happened? There is Prentice's ass over there, walking down the street in blue jeans. Cato squints. Well, I'll be goddamned. Wait, let's contemplate this. Let's get a plan together. I jump out of the car and slam the door while Cato is still working on a plan. I couldn't control myself. Cato is yelling Morgan's name. She can't stop me from getting answers from Prentice. Not only did I come for Mama, 
I need to know if he's my father. Prentice! I scream, enraged by internal wounds. He keeps walking, so I pick my pace up to a jog, heart racing, seeing red. I catch up to him and he stops and stares at me like I'm a foreign object. We need to talk, I demand. Normally I'd be terrified, but I'm running on pure adrenaline. His eyes bulge. Are you talking to me? He replies. I said, Prentice, is this motherfucker deaf? He's acting like a complete idiot, as if he doesn't recognize me. Of course I'm talking to you. Harmony! I turn to view Morgan, who is racing toward me. She stops in front of me and pants, trying to catch her breath. She shifts her head to her left, then darts her gaze across the street. What's wrong with her? We've been searching for Mama all day, and she wants to play? Listen, tell me where my mother is right fucking now. I walk closer in his face. My face warms with anger. If he says something stupid, I'm going to knock the shit out of him. Right here and now. You have the wrong person, Prentice says. Morgan snatches me by my arm. Harmony, over there! She points across the street. I glance across the street, and there is Prentice. What the fuck? I twist back at the man standing in my face, and he is Prentice. My heart falls in the pit of my stomach. The next breath I take is nearly impossible because my lungs have stiffened. He walks around me and continues down the street. A car drives past and there is Prentice sitting in the passenger seat. What type of games are they playing on us? Two men with Prentice's face walked past me, Morgan utters. It's like they had a town just with clones of Prentice. How could this be? Cato's hit is for Prentice, but we found a bunch of clones. Fear clogs my heart. I'm no closer to finding Mama than I was when I first arrived in Louisiana. Morgan and I march over to the car. Then a siren rings out like a fire truck, but I don't smell any smoke. Cato walks toward us. What's the loud noise? I scream while covering my ears. A security alarm, Cato says. I read his lips. I can barely hear my thoughts. Why is a security alarm going off? The siren stops and the footsteps are closing in on us. I pivot around and view the huge guards nearly standing in my face. Their faces are red and angry. Sweat flings from their foreheads. I sense they want to fight. Cato walks in front of me. What's the problem? He asks. You're the problem, one guard says before swinging at Cato. All my attention is focused on the mark covering the other guard's right cheek. I concentrate on his face, trying to use my laser magic. There's no sickness within him. A spell isn't cast upon his family. It's a birthmark. He takes a swing at me. I grab his arm, but there is no buzz, no fire. Shit, my magic isn't working. This man will kill me. I back up as Morgan rushes to my side. He must kill both of us. He pounds his fist into his hand, glaring at me. Grabbing me with a strong force, he slings me across the street. Morgan has jumped on his back, straddling him from behind. I've gotten a little dizzy. I sit there on the ground, scanning the land. Everything in the land is sick, in need of healing. There are several fights happening. Everyone here is angry. I shake my head and concentrate on the land. My laser vision is hazy, but working. Before I blink, the land repairs itself. But there's fire burning within the trees, the wolves and the souls of the men involved in this fight. The fire is being repressed within the objects the same way my magic is being repressed. I need to free this land of the repressed energy. I dip down into my magic and a bolt of fire jerks from my hand, landing in a field. I spring to my feet as Morgan and Cato race to my side. What the hell is going on? Cato asks. The land is calling to me. It's sick, and fire is trapped in these towns and these people. That's why they're angry, I explain. What did you do? Morgan questions. I tried healing the land. Doesn't appear to have worked, I reply. Cato grabs my arm. We have to go. Now. We're surrounded by huge boulders and trees moving in toward us. The land is moving. What the hell have we gotten ourselves into? Morgan gasps out a panicked scream. One rock is nicking her feet. 
I graze the rock and it cracks. Get the fuck away from my friend, I scream. Harmony, I'm scared, Morgan yells while squeezing my arm. The huge tree is coming toward the guard with the birthmark on his face. He pulls out a blade and starts chopping at the tree. The tree swings its branches. The guard chops some off. He's had a fight with the land before. A vine wraps around Cato's leg. He grabs his leg and pulls, but the vine is gripping tighter. I grab the vine and a light buzz tingles my finger. The vine releases its grip and breaks in two. A loud rumble tears through the chaos as the ground beneath my feet rattles. My heart races. I'm scared to take a peek above my head, but I do. There's a huge boulder rolling down the road coming our way. Shit, we gotta make it to the car, Cato says. The fear in Morgan's face makes me anxious, but I have no time to entertain her fear. If we don't move quickly, this boulder will flatline our asses. I yank Morgan's arm as we jump over a rock racing toward the car. There's screaming and fire. Is this Armageddon? A battle with the land is crazy. We all jump in the car as the boulder is within feet of us. Where are the damn keys? Morgan screams. My eyes dart around the car and my intestines cramp. Holy shit, we don't have the keys. Could this day get any worse? Close your eyes and hold on, Cato says. A huge boulder is coming for the car. It's my last day on Earth. I certainly don't want to spend it fighting trees. Chapter 13 Cato teleports us back to Jazz's bar, if you want to call it a bar, and in the nick of time. I shiver remembering the size of the boulder. It will destroy anything in its path. Panic swirls in my gut. I'd never been so frightened. I've been a witness to horror, but nothing of this magnitude. What the hell have we gotten into? I yell. This place is nuts. Give me Detroit any day. This place is one hot-ass mess. Not everything needs to be healed, Harmony. Cato growls. Morgan's eyes tightly shut as she pants in exhaustion. My poor friend has been fighting all day. All she wants is a cool room and a fluffy bed. You already told me. I roll my eyes as a bead of sweat races down my face. Every muscle in my body is tense and sore. Finding Mama now won't be easy. There are people, objects, hell, lands, sick for a reason. His tone is sharp. The area is probably one of those locations. You can't heal everything. He hits the steering wheel of the car. Damn. He glances at the bar. I blink in fear. I understand why he's upset, but I don't have complete control all the time. How was I supposed to know the land would awaken? I question. You can't, so you shouldn't heal anything unless you're certain. He barks. I resisted the urge to shout, Give me a fucking break. I can't change what has happened already. My teeth clench and my jaw locks. Everybody calm down, Morgan says. We made it out safe. She yawns and slowly opens her eyes. Yeah, but there may be hell to pay the captain, Cato says. Morgan pops on the light. Harmony, let me inspect your tattoo since you healed the land. Oh, yeah, it should have grown now. Morgan is trying to help me keep a balance to stay healthy, to stay alive. I lower my shirt, exposing my chest, and Morgan gasps. It's not growing. Hell, it's getting smaller, Morgan says. I flip the sun visor down and glance in the mirror. The tattoo isn't getting any bigger, but it didn't get smaller. Maybe I'm keeping a balance. Morgan points toward the bar. We're not going back to the bar, are we? For a minute, Cato says. At least he took some bass out of his voice. I won't make the mistake again. I wasn't certain I could heal the land, but I had to try. As we walk in the smoky joint, the whole place goes silent. The band is playing country music, and once we enter, the band stops. The saxophone player jumps off the stage and makes his way over to us. Everyone stares at us as if we were the Grinches who stole Christmas. The tension thickens, raising the hair on the back of my neck. Soon enough, I'll know what the beef is about. Jazz storms from around the bar. The room practically rattles. Her hair changed from red to blue and back to red. 
She stomped all the way from the bar to us. She aims to shoot, and I don't want to get caught in the crossfire. She gets closer, and I view the anger whirl on her face. Cato, what's wrong with you? She barks. His eyes dart around the bar, as if he's puzzled and does not understand. Nothing? What are you talking about? He shrugs. She stares at me and Morgan like we need to get out of the way. She needs to have a seat. Her problem is with Cato. I shoot a glare back, but I'm uneasy. I'm finding it hard to fight the stomach acid creeping up my esophagus. My nervousness is getting the best of me. I feel awful about what I've done, but I'm not going to be chastised for it. She snatches Cato by the arm and walks off only two feet. I'm nosy, so I hear everything she's saying. A lot of us paranormals live here in New Orleans, and the shit you pulled awaken the land, she explains with a raised voice. Most paranormals don't understand what this means. Her face turns as red as her hair. Cato can't get a word in. She's pissed off. How did she find out so quick? Cato didn't do anything. I did. He shouldn't take the blame. But I stand there too paralyzed by fear to move. Not fear of jazz, but awakening the land may be deadly for some. The land hasn't been awakened in decades. She sizes him up. Damn, is she going to swing? The saxophone player stands at her side with his arms folded. Cato is fidgety, acting dodgy. Jazz, stay out of it, he says. Oh, you are covering for someone. She snaps her head in my direction and takes a few steps, coming to stand in my face. What is your role in this? Her eyes glaze over, an icy blue. The scent of ashes makes my lungs constrict. Maybe it's her or this smoky-ass bar. Either way, it's hard for me to breathe. But I have enough strength to whip her ass. Cato grabs her by the arm. They had nothing to do with this. She snatches her arm back. Come on, out with it! She shouts, walking toward me. This bitch better get out of my face. But it flows out. I healed the land. I throw my hand on my hip. Her hair turns a steel gray and sends quivers down my tendons. Shit, I've pissed her off now. She shakes her head furiously, and the smoke coming from her face is scorching. Get out! Hold on. Wait a minute, Jazz. She didn't know, Cato explains. I will not protect someone like her, she screams. She has a smart mouth and a nasty attitude. She shakes her fist in my face. I step back before I swing. Cato better get her out of my face. Where do you come off? Coming here, touching things? Calm down, Jazz, Cato says, grabbing her arm. Little girl, you have no idea what you are messing with. Her face has returned to its original color. Her voice is monotone. Get out of New Orleans before you do more damage. I've had enough of her ranting. Just because I'm not ancient doesn't mean she needs to talk down to me. Let's go, Morgan. I feel bad enough. We storm out of the bar passing several onlookers. They watch the argument like it's a Mike Tyson fight. I'm pissed, but at myself. Tears fill my eyes. How could I be this stupid and easily distracted? I've caused all this damage and I still haven't found mama. We'll find your mama. It's not your fault. She's being a bitch, Morgan says. She has the hots for Cato. That's her real problem with you. Me? You're in the way of her being with Cato. And Cato stands there not defending me. The tears flow down my cheeks. He has a thing for her. No, he tried. She was pissed, but he never said you did anything. Morgan is right. She's screaming in a jealous rage, telling me to leave New Orleans. I'll leave, but I'm not going anywhere until I find Mama. Chapter 14 I awaken to birds chirping, soreness, and soft sheets. My eyes snap open. I nearly forgot I'm in New Orleans. There sure as hell ain't birds chirping in Detroit. I move to the side and worse pain creeps into my forearm. I shake my hands in an attempt to relieve the soreness of my muscles. I slip the purple comforter back, trying to confirm this is Mama's room. The room is elegant compared to the house in Detroit. The sheets are cream and silk, 
The bed is huge with one of those memory foam mattresses. Mama came into some money. I scanned the room, locating the closet. A ton of blacks, grays, and browns. This is definitely Mama's room. As I try repositioning myself in bed, pain shoots up my back. I sigh and rub it. What a battle yesterday. I push down on the bed with my palms and my hands sink into the mattress. I am never getting out of this bed. I don't want to. It's the most comfortable bed I've been in. But I do have to do my job. Anxiety twists in my gut once, twice, three times. Hopelessness is setting in. Will I ever find Mama? Maybe I'm too late. I get a whiff of bacon. Morgan must be cooking. Hopefully she made breakfast for me too. I'm starving. The bedroom door flies open and Morgan peeks in the door, her brown eyes dancing with excitement. Are you hungry? She enters the room in booty shorts and a beater with a giant fork in her hand. I bust out in a laugh. Are those pajamas? Yep, too hot to wear anything else around here. What are you cooking? I question. Bacon and eggs. She stares at me, waiting for my complaint. Morgan can't cook for shit, but as hungry as I am, I'll eat anything. We have to hurry. Get back to town. I roll to the side of the bed, finally getting up. I noticed a couple of people on Bourbon Street I want to ask a question. Snoop around to find some information. Detective Harmony, Morgan replies with a snicker. I roll my eyes at Morgan before grabbing a picture of Mama off her nightstand. A picture of her taken recently. She has on the shirt that we bought at the mall last year. We will need this picture. Someone had to spot her around town. We get to Bourbon Street mid-morning. The sun is up but isn't beaming down on us. It's still hot. By noon, the heat will be unbearable. The potion handlers and farmers are out already. And a lot of shoppers. Now is my time to ask questions. I spot a woman sitting at a stand with a large painted sign in front that says tarot card readings. The person I need to talk to. Her mysterious eyes and flowing skirt have me mesmerized. Morgan and I march toward her stand. We take a seat on the old milk crate sitting in front of her table. Who wants the tarot reading? She babbles. Morgan points to me as I raise my hand. She has jewels galore, even a ruby in the middle of her forehead. She wears a skirt and a half shirt with her belly button exposed. She can't have any kids because her stomach is as flat as a board. She pulls a stack of cards from her fanny pack. Then she places them on the table, scattering the cards around while staring in my face. Her wheat-colored hair is styled in two long braids. What are you expecting from this reading? She asks. I shrug. Clarity, I guess. I'm trying to locate my mother. She flicks the cards back and forth from one hand to the next. She flips one card over, labeled the fool, then places it on the table. And I nearly spit fire. I am no one's fool, but carry on. She flips another card labeled lovers. I'm a fool in love, I growl. No, these are two different cards. You are around a lover. Are you in love? Uh, no, I shake my head. It's in your cards. You will fall in love. The fool card means you need to be careful. Don't be easily persuaded. Ponder before you react. She nods. I got it. Twenty dollars, please. She holds her hand out. I was going to slap her five. The reading took all of five minutes and it's twenty dollars? I need this hustle. I pay the lady before racing from her table. She might hustle me out of the shirt on my back. We continue down the road viewing the vendor tables. A woman passes us and gives me a nasty stare. She's a shifter. I observe the fur on her paws. I lean back, skeptical of who she is. Hopefully this is not another relative. Or another attack, like Derek in the pack. She stops, pivoting around to us. I don't want to harm you. I want to say thank you, she says calmly, a thick twang to her voice. Staring at her bronze face, it's like I've seen her somewhere before. It must be deja vu. For what? I shake my head, puzzled by what she's talking about. I need to show you how you save me. Morgan and I follow her. Morgan tugs at my arm and whispers, Are you sure about this? I nod yes. It can't hurt. They've accused me of causing trouble since I got here. 
Someone thanking me for something is a breath of fresh air. I at least want to know why. We walk with her for a while. In silence, she is focused on her destination. Until we come upon the land I accidentally awakened last night. I tremble internally. I'm sure she isn't thanking me for this. What's her motive? Morgan, eyebrows knitted together, her confused expression. Is she going to attack us? Hell, I'm still sore from yesterday. We traveled a long way on a different path to end in the same location, but I examine the land differently now. I sense the power of the land, maybe because the sun is shining. There wasn't much power last night. I'm sorry, Harmony. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Jennifer. She has a fresh baby powder scent with periwinkle blue eyes. She has the brightest smile, and her spirit is so happy. Her presence is calming. She won't hurt us. This is my friend Morgan. Ha, Morgan. She extends her hand, exposing the thick fur. My laser magic is kicking in, and I know this land is ancient, but somehow important. My heart palpitates. Shit. Did I wake the dead? This land was stolen from my ancestors many years ago, then used as an instrument to trap my people in this moon curse. She gasps, then exhales. The tension rolls off her shoulders. When you healed the land, you released the moon curse from the werewolves. She smiles. Now we are free thanks to you. She turns her attention to me. Her face shows gratitude. We can shift whenever we want. We don't have to hide or be bullied anymore. Shit. I open Pandora's box. Maybe this is not such a good idea. Healing this land could be catastrophic for the rest of the paranormals. We trudge up a slight hill and walk farther out in the middle of the land. The trees sway and the grass is an emerald green. Last night, these trees were attacking us. Now they are part of the land. Derek and his pack crept from the shadows of the woods. My first instinct is to grab Morgan and run, but his face is peaceful. He grins, showing crooked teeth. The pack comes closer and Morgan moves closer to me. She was clawed by one of them yesterday, but it's not happening today. Derek kneels down to the ground. I close my eyes and then open them again. My eyes must be playing an awful trick, but when I open my eyes, there he is kneeling before me, along with Jennifer and the rest of the pack. You have rescued us. Therefore, we will assist you in whatever you need. Chapter 15 What is going on around here? The wolves are kneeling at my feet, as if I'm the leader of the pack. I didn't awaken the land for them. It was an accident. With rapid shakiness in my knees, I nearly fall to the ground. I glance over at Morgan, whose darting gaze lands on the face of Derek. Either she's shocked or terrified, but she stands as still as a deer caught in headlights. The only thing moving is her slick black hair, ruffling in the slight wind. Harmony. A sharp, deep voice calls from nearby. I recognize the voice. However, I'm stuck staring at the werewolves before my eyes. I'm soaked with sweat from anxiety. I can't believe this. Wishing I could disappear is imminent in the back of my mind. A tap on my shoulder snaps me out of it. Pivoting around to the hand on my shoulder, my warm gaze lands upon Morgan. I'm confused. Because I didn't consider it was her calling my name. Morgan points to the street behind me. I blindly turn my head toward the street where I view Cato coming toward me. He is the one calling my name. I wipe the damp hair from my face, then race to him, leaving the pack kneeling. I need his help. I don't have a clue about wolf packs except they shift. After the brawl involving the pack, I am a little terrified. And since I'm paranoid, I assume it might be a trap. But I need help. I've got to trust someone other than Morgan. What's going on over here? He wipes his brow as sweat trickles down his chest. Why are they kneeling at your feet? He questions. My magic has gotten dark, I say, trying to avoid the questions he asked. Harmony, trust me, you don't have any dark magic. He points to the wolves who are now standing and chit-chatting amongst themselves. What's this? He gulps the last bit of water from a bottle, then tosses it across the field. Against my better judgment, I tell him what Jennifer said. 
He was already angry before I healed the land. I don't want him to be even more pissed now. Now be more careful around Andrea. Why? Why? The pack is her biggest enemy. Are you kidding me? His face is now bright red. I've got no energy to argue. I am hot, sweaty, and frustrated. Since you've awakened the land and broken a curse for the wolves, she will view you as an enemy. I lower my head as my blood goes cold, causing me to shiver. I didn't realize the possible negative effect on my relationship with Andrea. After all, she's my family, and she has been nothing but welcoming since I arrived to New Orleans. Who will tell her? If she doesn't know, I can't become her enemy. Besides, the wolves sniff out a person ten times better than any other paranormal. He raises a brow, silently assessing my face, nostrils flaring. News around here spreads like wildfire. There's only a limited amount of time before she knows. His voice raises. I understand. I hold my hands up. We're wasting time. I came here to tell you I located Prentice's base of operations. He bites his bottom lip. Sneaky bastard is hiding on the east side of town. Last place I would search. My heart rate speeds up and I almost wince. You did? However, there's no sight of Jeanette at the location. He scratches his head. I want to construct an offense against Prentice. What did you have in mind? I'm willing to do almost anything to get my mother home. He shakes his head. Don't have a plan yet. I snap my finger. I've got it! I'll ask Andrea to run an offense against Prentice while I save my mother. Remember, Jeanette might not be there. No one has seen a lady. She's there. Where else would she be? I assure him. And I have these werewolves with their amazing ability to find Mama by her scent. I hold my index finger up at Cato and race over to the wolves. The gravel crunches as I run, stinging my feet. My body is sluggish and sore from the day before. I have to ignore the pain. Before I make it to Derek, Morgan grabs me by my forearm. A sharp expression of fear crosses her face. My aura tells me there's danger relating to your mom, and it doesn't feel good. I shake my head. Don't worry, Morgan. It'll be okay. Cato might have found her. She releases her grip and steps aside. I need some help to find my mother, I say to the pack. She was kidnapped. I reach in my purse and pull out the picture I took from the nightstand. Derek grabs the picture and glances at it before taking a sniff. He passes it around to the rest of the pack. What is this? Sniff and scratch? The rest of the pack is sniffing the picture. Is their scent detector strong enough to pick up her scent from a picture? We got her scent. We will break into different groups to go find her. He hands the picture to me, then wipes his nose with his paw. A white dove flies above my head, landing on Morgan's shoulder. I continue conversing with Derek, but I notice the bird shift into a small woman with steel-gray eyes. I observe her from the corner of my eye as she and Morgan have a conversation. Derek continues talking, and I catch what he says, all while having my attention on Morgan. The grim sight of despair graces Morgan's face. I strut away from Derek, leaving him talking as the rest of the pack disperses. Before I make it to Morgan, the woman quickly shifts back into a dove, and as quick as she came, she flies away. I continue walking to Morgan, and judging by her face, it isn't good news. The hum of her heartbeat is loud enough for me to hear. We get within a foot of each other, and Morgan's eyes fill with tears. My heart stops. My hands tremble. It's something horrific. Morgan hardly ever cries. I swallow the lump of pain in my throat, telling myself as long as Mama is alive, I will get through this. Who's the shifter? Um, uh... She fidgets around. Sweat beams down her temples. The suspense is eating me alive. Come on, out with it, I demand. She's a messenger from Prentice, she sighs. Okay, and? She said your mom is in danger and the clock is ticking. Did she say she was hurt? My eyes bulge. Morgan darts glances around, then at the ground, trying to avoid eye contact with me. This is serious. I need her attention. I grab her face. Is my mother hurt? My voice is a low growl, strong and assertive. No, not yet. 
I remove my hand and gasp, placing my hand over my heart. She's not hurt, and we still have time. Maybe not much. I race over to Cato. I need to let him know. Morgan follows behind. Cato, I say, panting, trying to catch my breath. Can I count on you to do one thing for me? I don't completely trust Cato, but I have no other choices. He has the most resources here. This is his hometown. Of course. You will learn to trust me one day. I'm on your side. Get Andrea to run the offense. Distract him. He nods. No problem. Then he trots down the hill toward the city. Exhausted from the sun beaming above our heads, I take a seat on the grass and lay my head on my knees. I'm not sure what's worse, not knowing where she is or finally knowing for certain Prentice has her. Morgan takes a seat on the grass beside me. We'll find her, she says, trying to give me hope. I appreciate having a friend like Morgan. She traveled across the country to help me. Footsteps hitting the gravel behind us startle me, and I glance back to witness who is there. It's Derek, and he's back fast. I spring to my feet, then nervously walk forward. Did he find out anything? Shit. I push my hair back and bite on my inner cheek. His eyes dart around the scenery, as if worried someone is listening. His gaze lands on my face. Got a location, and the scent is fresh. Chapter 16 Holy shit! A huge castle with a pointed roof. Spooky is an understatement. I'd bet there are tons of spirits floating through this house. Dark clouds loom across a dusky gray sky. The castle is three times the size of Andrea's headquarters. It sits alone on a hill with nothing in sight for at least two city blocks. We're going in alone to find Mama? I question. Yes and they have 24-hour guards, Derek says as we watch the castle. My laser vision is hazy, but I observe someone pacing the pavement. I zero in on a creature standing in front of the entrance. His orange eyes are like flames of fire. Horns peel from his skull. Gray fur zips along its tail. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm sure it will do some damage to us. There's a guard at each entrance, Derek mutters. No telling how many on the inside. We'll need more backup. Me, Jennifer, Derek, and Morgan can't take on all these beasts. I try again to use my laser magic, but it's clouded by a thick haze. I gasp, realizing something other than my inadequate abilities is blocking my magic. I'll have to go old school and use my two fists, because I am not leaving without Mama. Derek lifts his hand to his forehead to block out the sun. Some other wolves are coming. A long sigh escapes from his lips, as if he is relieved we have more fighting power. Three male wolves come ready for war. Derek devises a plan. Enter through the side door. The guard's standing watch is much smaller. The castle is gigantic, but by the time he calls for backup, we will be in already. With the other wolves, we are now seven strong. We have to get there and quick before someone becomes suspicious of us. We race toward the side entrance. Our intended goal is to ambush the guard. A cool breeze from air circling the castle brushes against my legs. I keep running at the guards straight ahead. Blades of wet grass hit my ankles. Anxiety pierces my guts. Too late to turn back now. The pack shifts into wolves racing down the hill. It's hard for me and Morgan to keep up, but we are only feet behind. Shit. The guard spots us and grabs his walkie-talkie. Before he gets a word out, Derek shifts and slams him against the stone wall of the castle. He slides down to the ground. We reach the door and I push and pull on the door. It doesn't budge. I'm trying to catch my breath, but a panic attack is coming on. For a second, everything is silent. Morgan's voice brought me back. My lungs open and I take in a deep breath. Morgan smacks her lips. The door is a thick wood and locked. Derek grunts and raises his hands, shaking the keys he must have gotten out of the guard's pocket. Problem is, there's 20 keys, and we don't have time to check all of them. Derek tries two of the keys before static from the walkie-talkie floats through the air. Benny, are you there? The voice from the walkie-talkie says. We only have a few minutes before they realize Benny is out cold. 
I grab the keys from Derek and scan the keychain. All the keys appear the same. One has a skull engraved on the top, so this must be it. I grab it and it zaps me. I grab it again, trembling, but get the key in the door. The key turns and my entourage cheers quietly. After such a close call, sweat trickles from my brow as I push the door open. We creep in one by one. I go behind Derek since he's the leader of the pack. Better that Derek gets hit first. Everything is silent and dark. We walk up a set of stairs and come upon a kitchen. The gray clouds barely allow any light through the window. One wolf flicks the light on the wall. She's here, another wolf says as he sniffs the air. He points toward the ceiling. She's upstairs. I smell the blood pumping through her veins. Damn, they can pick up a drop of blood a hundred miles away. Their noses are better than any hound dog. Their keen sense is magnificent. Good thing they're on my side and not my enemies. Okay, we'll break up in small groups, Derek says before a crash comes from the front of the house. Shit, the guards know we're here. Break now. Everyone scatters, but we are surrounded by three beasts. Derek shifts into a full silver werewolf and attacks. The largest of the beasts knocks Derek to the floor. I drop the keys and race to the sink in search of a knife. I'll need more than my fists. I don't get more than a few feet before I'm thrown against the wall. My hands are yanked roughly behind my back. I squirm uselessly, trying to get free. My magic better kick in, or else this will be the end. The heat from his breath with the stench of jalapenos nearly melts my neck. A deep grunt, then a thick, muffled voice asks, What's your business here? I'm here to find my mama. My voice is shaky. I'm petrified, my stomach queasy. Breakfast may come rushing through my mouth. My face gets pushed harder into the wall. You came to the wrong damn house. Your mama isn't here, little girl. My breathing rapid, my body shaky from the corner of my eye, I view Morgan with a large object in her hand, aiming for his head. Thump. Boom. He crashes to the ground. My hands free, I close my eyes and let out a sigh. Turning around, I see another creature charging toward me. There are five beasts in here now. I jump and kick him in the stomach. He stumbles back and then charges toward me again. I'm using what I have, but he is too strong and overbearing. He grabs me by the throat. I struggle, trying to breathe, then I knee him in the stomach. He releases his grip from my throat so he can grab his stomach. I race to Morgan, who is pinned down by a beast. My teeth crack with anger. I grab the beast and fire shoots from my hand. My magic is working again. The beast rolls off Morgan, and I turn and unleash a bolt of fire to the asshole who had me by the throat. The wolves are clawing at three huge beasts. Now Morgan and I will slip away and get Mama. Let's go, Morgan. We race toward the winding staircase. I get dizzy sprinting toward the top of the staircase. Morgan moves slower than me. Her footsteps stop. I twist around and glance at Morgan, who has taken a seat on the staircase, holding her leg. What's wrong? I gasp. I got cut. Blood seeps through the cracks of her fingers. It's okay. I'm coming. She stands, and I view the small ring-shaped wound. I turn and keep racing up the stairs. Once we get Mama, I'll heal her. It's small. It won't kill her. We reach the third flight, and right before my face, appearing from dust, is Prentice. My eyes bulge. Shit. What took you so long? He grins, fangs bared. I rush toward him, and he bolts fire from his hand. It passes my left arm, nearly melting my hair before hitting the wall. His fire is scorching hot. The next bolt won't miss, he warns. I hold my hand out, and nothing but dark smoke emerges. My magic is out of commission again. This is the wrong time. Mama? I scream. Harmony? She yells. I gasp at the beauty of her voice. She's alive. Mom, where are you? There are several doors and more stairs. I spin in confusion. Don't take another step if you want your mother alive, he growls. I pause, hands in the air. Let her go. This is between you and me. Prentice backs up to a door and opens it. My heart nearly jumps out of my body. 
Anger washes over me as I witness Mama standing there in the flesh. Are you okay? Did they hurt you? She has on a floral dress and her eyes are swollen from crying. I'm okay, she says. I inch closer. I want to hug her, let her know everything would be okay. Not another step, he barks. I stop and glare at Prentice. It takes all I have not to run to my mother, but I don't want him to hurt her. What do you want, Prentice? Give me my mother. Respect, he says before he unleashes a cloud of thick smoke. I can't recognize anything. Coughing, I walk closer and wave the smoke away from my face. Once the dust settles, my mother and Prentice have vanished. I fall to my knees and sob uncontrollably. Morgan hugs me. I wipe the tears from my eyes and sniffle. Impending doom is upon me. I have to get myself together. I won't let Prentice win this war. We'll find her. This shit ain't over. I'll get Prentice. Sneak Peek of Eternal Shadow Prologue Normally I'm not afraid of the dark, but in the south, the night skies become pitch black. The street lights are few and far between, just like the houses. Not that I can't defend myself. I can. However, I'm walking alone down a dirt road in an unfamiliar territory. I don't look dangerous. I'm a small-framed girl wearing comfortable flip-flops and stretchy shorts. No visible weapons. No obvious aura of magic. You wouldn't know I'm supernatural. The clack of my steps hit the pavement as I trot down the street. Night has fallen upon me as I make my way to Mama's from the gas station. I had the sudden craving for ice cream, but they didn't have butter pecan. Mainly, I need to clear my head. A short walk always does me good. My arms and legs ache, covered with scratches and small bruises. It won't stop me from searching for Mama. The stuffiness never stops here. It's humid still, but not unbearable. The brush of the grass and sting of mosquitoes licking at my shins make me hurry. The scent of the summer's fresh-cut grass and blooming flowers reminds me of southern living. We never get the aroma of flowers in night heights. I picture Mama's face, remembering her smile. She must be terrified. I will bring her home. The sound of footsteps behind me puts me on alert. I'm too nervous to turn around and look. Is it an animal or two people? I pick up the pace, staring straight ahead. I'm ready to whip out my magic. Cato told me I needed to be careful. He'd be pissed if he knew I was out by myself. Harsh whispers drift through the air. It's not an animal behind me. The tenor voices of men are a dagger to my soul, making my mouth go dry as I try to stay calm. If it's two men, I can take them if they're not supernatural. My breathing increases. Then I see a flash of bright lights up ahead. It's a car barreling down the road. Should I flag them down? The car gets closer and I view a man with electric blue hair. His face is pasty and he glares at me. I inch closer to the car. He continues going after showing his fangs. Another blood-sucking vampire. I've got to get home. Only two blocks to go. I don't have time for this shit. I've got bigger things on my mind. If they're trying to sneak up on me, they are doing a terrible job. One of them must be heavier. His breathing is loud and rough. Morgan must be worried, but I'll be home in a minute once I get these wannabe stalkers off my ass. I take a swift right at the corner to make sure they are indeed following me. For a few seconds, there are no footsteps. I wipe the sweat from my brow. They're gone. I thought they were trouble. As soon as my heart rate decreases, the footsteps sound again. It's best to get prepared. These fuckers want a problem. I'll be just the one to give it to them, as long as my magic works. They have a slight advantage over me. Not just because they are men. They know the city better than I do. I can't make any more turns or else I'll be lost and unable to get back to Mama's house. I move from a street with an occasional streetlight to one with a flickering dim light several hundred feet ahead. I blink and keep moving. I need to reach the light. Then I will turn around and unleash my magic. Right now, the night consumes most of my vision. No point in fighting the darkness. It's clear to me they are not professionals. If Prentice had sent them to hunt me, I wouldn't hear them coming. 
This is the perfect time to attack, while I'm visually impaired by the night. The suspense is killing me. I spin around, and they have the same faces. Twins, I suppose. Their hair is the same electric blue as the guy who passed me in the car. Their faces match too. Get her. I spring into a run without a destination. I'm lost, but I can't stop now. My feet are heavy and the footsteps get closer. I run faster, darting my gaze from left to right. I notice a dark alley up ahead. I duck off into the alley. The darkness will protect me. They won't be able to see me. Once they get here searching for me, I'll unleash a bolt of hot magic. Hiding behind a garbage can with sweat racing down my face, my heart beats like a drum. This town has too many clones. They tiptoe past the garbage can, and I hold my breath, not wanting to make a peep. One is fading. His body is a shell of the other twin. The other one is more substantial. He is the leader as the spirit twin follows. I inch back toward the wall as a rattle sounds out. I cover my mouth and glance over at the garbage can. I knock the top off. The footsteps come my way. I ignore my fears and dip into my magic. The garbage can scrapes against the gravel. As soon as they expose my body, I unleash magic balls one after another. The solid one goes flying across the alley. I pause, preparing to release more fire at the other. My hands tremble. If he comes any closer, he is toast. He darts his gaze from me to his twin, and then runs off. I exhale. Shit. They nearly got me. Read Eternal Shadow. Books2read.com slash u slash 3n8ga8. Sign up for my newsletter. Subscribepage.com slash f2v6g5. This has been Eternal Fire, a new adult urban fantasy series, written by R.L. Wilson, narrated by Sky Alley.